maybe it's just like someone just cut it straight or something and then just that wouldn't surprise me because <laughs> um the way the way that our living room lights were wired up that it was terrifying you could have sort of put your foot down in one bad spot in the loft and that would have been the end of your life well mm. I, I mean in fairness actually there's there's something weird going on with this setup here so i've got um a pair of speakers on a like a usb powered deck and uh if i you know like if i've got like the volume set to four or something on the on the pc and i sort of walk out of my room there's a it's like a patch on the floor that when i step on it it um it does something with the earth it kind of trips the you just hear like this like crack um as the the cone on the speakers move and it somehow resets the volume on windows so it's then at like 100 percent. that's very weird really bizarre because like i'll get up to go to the toilet or something I'll just hear like a like a pop yeah yeah like and the, then the i know one. that then you know, like a notification comes through and it's like oh, bloody hell you know it's... <laughs> i don't know i could i couldn't even speculate on what is causing that absolutely no clue i've been doing it for four years <laughs> Have you, have you tried walking in and out of the room at different speeds to see if it's like the, <laughs> the static that you generate? I, I've I have tried all sorts. It's just it, it's got to be some earth fault somewhere. But everything I've tested and poked and prodded at, it's and why it's doing it, it's only an earth fault, but in the USB, so it must not be must be something earth into maybe the DAC or some. I, I've, yeah, it could be like an, an internal earth fault or something like that, or or it's or, or like like well, like we've experienced before, where it's um, a reversed um, live and neutral. Yeah, well, Which, I wired all the sockets in, so it's, I know it's not that because I've well, it, had them all. Well, I've had them all opened and checked. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's that because that can cause all kinds of weird because obviously the, the the full bridge rectifier inside of your uh, adapters and that sort of stuff generally doesn't care what way the electricity is going in and out. No, once yeah. it goes through the rectifier, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But it's only once you put like an imbalanced load on the circuit, yeah, that you start getting them drops, and it does it does get a bit strange. And like the full I, that's the through. only thing I can think of is that because it is so far away from, it must just be a volt drop. That's but why yeah, exactly. stepping on a particular point of the floor that's doing it? I, that's what's baffling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, yeah, I mean, I'd, but... I'd, I'd, I'd be tempted to kind of maybe lift the floor very carefully and see if there are any nails going through cable. Yeah. No, well, it, it, there aren't through this cable because I run it all. It's all surface mount on the wall in conduit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That, 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 yeah, it makes it makes absolutely no sense as to what what it could be doing. That is, that is a bizarre one. Yeah. <laughs> I, say, I need to get uh, NDP here. But that's that's both of you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it doesn't narrow it down, does it? <laughs> yeah, you said I think like yeah, writing the sh show note sort of plan of this a bit earlier is like right, I write Andy. Oh no, but they write me rather than <laughs> yeah. <laughs> me, no, just, just, write, just write just write AP. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh no, wait, that doesn't. Work, does <laughs> yeah, what's your middle initial? Have you got a middle initial? Uh, two J R. Ah, right. Okay. Well, we can't put J R. I see it. <laughs> Think yeah. we see you. Um, do you remember my mum's maiden name? I think it's the street that I grew up on. Yeah, and uh, inside leg measurement, if you could. Uh, yeah, I mean... N like, name of uh, your cat when you were young? <laughs> yeah, first pet, yeah. Dave. Colour color of your first car. Um, well, I, I can say, and, and uh, any you know Facebook posts you've made in the last 12 months, but... Uh, none, because you, I don't have yeah. Facebook. <laughs> I'm one of those people. I'm just on Twitter. Uh, oh, and Instagram, and YouTube, and Vero, and Imager, and Reddit, and <laughs> I think that's it. And I'm on Steam as well, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but just not Facebook. Uh, yeah. yeah, just not Facebook. <laughs> just everything else. Sensible. Sensible. <laughs> yeah, at least, at least, you know, keep your footprint to 94% uh, of the uh, of, of the internet, not, not the 95th percent of the internet. <laughs> Yeah, I just, I don't really, Facebook is sort of one of those, uh, what would you, what's the best, what's the, the best way to put it? Um, it's just one of those platforms that's, it's very inward looking. 
it's like you create your circle of friends on your circle of mm. contacts and you are and you stay within that whereas i prefer a lot of the, the sort of the more like t- twitter and instagram they're much more outward facing yeah it's easier to find people rather than yeah and to make new contacts and for people to sort of come yeah. in and find you and, and that sort of encourages you to be maybe a little bit more creative rather than just go on there and tell people about what beans you bought in the shop that week is just because you're i'm only interacting with just my friends just my friends just my friends hang on a minute hang on a minute you you quite often tell us what weird beans or weird fizzy milk you bought that week so you can wide your neck in there mister yeah yes yeah um <laughs> i haven't actually oh no, what, what can of spunk you've bought this week or whatever um, weird flavored name thing um <laughs> A while ago, I bought a bag of. Uh, they were noodles that you eat raw, like crispy noodles that you eat raw. What? Uh, they were quite nice, actually. <laughs> so like, basically, okay. if you imagine, imagine someone got like um, like a super noodle, mm-hmm, and then yeah. like opened the bag, took out the flavor sachet, emptied it in, and then just crushed up the noodles, and then you just eat them. It was. Uh, they were beef flavored. <laughs> it didn't have golden wonder on the packet or anything did it <laughs> no it was it was it was all in a language that i could not read i had to use Very google Translate. Like, yeah. google, like google uh translate the, the the camera version is like the best thing ever because it's, it's either real. perfectly accurate or absolute mm-hmm. nonsense yeah and you just look at it and go yeah i'll give it a go <laughs> I love that sort of thing, though, is with like uh, the um, the nuance of language. You know, certain phrases that might be slang or things like that that end up as being standard terminology over generations and stuff. It's, I think one of the brilliant things with that with with language, you know, that those kind of um, it's like we were having a chat the other day talking about like cars and car names in different countries and how they'd you know certain cars didn't work particularly well you know like the, the toyota mr2 when it came to france because of it sounded like the toyota shit because of yeah, MR2, yeah, yeah. you know and things like that you know those kind of um nuances of language that there's, you don't necessarily think about there's there's a br- brilliant one in um from mitsubishi they manufactured a, a car it was sort of to compete with the um, for Capri in this country. I, I was, that was going to be my next story. The, as well. uh, the, P- the Pinto sort of like Fords in America. And to sort of, again, coming with like the, the pony class of car to be like this, there's the Mustang and they were like, we want the Stallion. And obviously in, I don't know what kind of telephone conversation got across it, but in Britain, we got the what they called in the advert the Star Ryan, but is unfortunately the Starion. And it's just this. It was, it it's was like, it's purely actually a really nice car. But yeah, yeah. it's actually Starion. Because it was just a, a misunderstanding on a phone call. <laughs> yeah. And obviously they caught it because they started calling it the Star Ryan, <laughs> which is an <laughs> even worse name, to be honest with you. <laughs> But yeah, that and the um, the Isuzu Mysterious Utility Wizard, and <laughs> which is which is what in this country was the Vauxhall Frontier, which is an incredibly du- they they turned away yeah. Mysterious Utility Wizard and were like no Frontier, that's what we we'll have. <laughs> oh, I do sometimes wonder about the processes they go through for kind of you know, naming cars. Yeah, it's like. Which came first, the Ford Escort or the Top Shelf magazine of the same name, not the Ford <laughs> bit? The um, th- there are some weird like naming conventions. Obviously, um, with things like uh, Volkswagen, they mm-hmm. tend to name like series of cars after particular things. So a lot of them are, you know, some of them are named after sports, your polo, your golf, and all that sort of stuff. But then you start getting their off-roaders, and they're like the Tuareg and the Kashkai and a few of the other ones. And they're all Kashkai's named after... Like, Nissan. 
Oh yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> it is. So but it's, it's, um, Tiguan and the Tiguan, the Tuareg, the there is Thai... another one. Yeah, there's another one, and they're all they're all nomadic African tribes and stuff like that. Mm. Um, yeah. And then you've got the other ones who who just name their cars numbers, <laughs> <laughs> which just just well, to make it... things really confusing. Because that was Mass the thing with Persia, three, wasn't it? Two, three. That was the thing with the, with Persia with the obviously having like the. The yep. the one series being the small cars, so you know your one hundred five, your one hundred six, your one hundred seven, and then when they did the little tiny mini MPV thing with sliding doors, yeah, the one double oh seven. No, you're not allowed oh, sorry, to call it the one zero zero seven. Yes, you can't yep. call it. 1007. You can call it the one thousand and seven or the one zero zero seven because if you call it the one double oh seven, they have to pay a license. Yes, for, to bond. <laughs> they're they're, they're so, actually yeah. a, a really good car in yeah. in the modern That's what world. I've heard, yeah. Because, like, I don't know how it is where you are, but the roads where I am are really quite tight, and people are always, like, opening the doors into the street. And having mm-hmm. a car with sliding doors just makes yeah. so much sense. But, Definitely, no, yeah. no we, we can't deal with that kind of forward thinking. We have to have... <laughs> we must we must engage with tradition and have opening doors this way. I quite I quite like... We've, we've got a... We've got two cars. A, a, a Ford C-Max and a Nissan Juke. The Nissan Duke, which is a little bit poorly at the moment. Um, yes, I've heard. Yeah, yeah, a little bit poorly. Kind of met a curb that was a bit too big. Kind of yeah, too sticky, bit poorly. not like curbs are meant to be. Yeah, yes, yeah, I was going to say it was sticking out an awful way. And it's going, it's going to a trip to the garage tomorrow to check out why it's not steering straight. Um, but if, if I, I really like the C Max, C Max is probably one of the nicest cars. I've I've had, but I quite I quite like if if the I I don't like the Duke, it it looks like a tank. It's tiny inside. It, it's it's not it's not a nice car. The the boot on it is a bit random as well. Oh, the the boot is the boot for the size of the car is tiny. It's such a huge car. It's got such yeah. a small. It's like triangular, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah. it's triangular inside. There's there's kind of multiple layers of kind of you can lift up one layer. So it's a flat bit, but not very big. You which you can put like three bags of shopping if you're lucky along the not yeah, it's not ordinary carry bags and not bags for life um, and then you can kind of lift that up and there's another compartment and you lift that up there's a space where a spare wheel should be um, but it isn't and it's, I mean, it's, it's not a great car but I, I would really quite like as it's kind of a second car because of where we live two, having two cars is, is fairly essential really if, if I was replacing the Duke I would seriously look at the B-Max which has got is smaller than the C Max. Obviously, mm. it's based on the Fiesta, so the the C Max is based on the Ford Focus chassis. The C Max is based, uh, B Max is based on the Fiesta chassis, so it's that quite a bit smaller, and it's got the sliding doors on the back, so which makes for quite a nice mm. sort of vehicle. No, um, no central pillar this either. Is crap car top gear. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I. I have you ever seen the the other one they do is the the Ford? It's, they call it the Echo Sport, but it's the Eco Sport, and it's yeah. just one mm. little like sort of like mini SUV based on the Fiesta. It's a great little car, and it's, yeah, yeah, it's got yeah. it's got a proper like open like back opening full size door. Yeah, and it's like that. yeah, great little thing. Yeah, much better car than the Duke. Yeah, my sister we, um, had one. We had before the car we got now. We had we had a Skoda Yeti, which is like this Volkswagen Auto Group kind of like adventure tourer kind of four wheel drive thing mm. and it was like going from that to this car is hard work because in that you had this huge great boot and then you lift up the back of it and it had all these like areas for putting all of your adventure supplies into <laughs> like a full size wheel and a big thing for all your straps and hoists and bits like that. And so I had it all full of absolute junk that I never used but was just you know, had to buy because it looked so cool, and you know, have the big no, spanner right. and the big hammer and the big and the rope, the tow rope and multiple <laughs> uh, high visibility vests and like all that sort of stuff. And um, we've got this this car we've got now, and I sort of opened the boot and I'm like, where, where do I put all my things? These <laughs> these things that are essential to my to my trip to my tra- I've never used, but are essential in case I get trapped on the side of a mountain in this car. And uh, it, this car doesn't even have it doesn't have um, a spare wheel. It doesn't even try. Uh, it has it give, they give you an air compressor, a little battery powered air compressor, mm-hmm. and a bottle of slime. 
and, uh, and good wishes, basically. Yeah, my my new one's got the same. Yeah, so I think I just there's a big space that I can't do anything with because you've put a couple of awkwardly shaped bits of other stuff there. Yeah, so I can cut the cut the bits of rubbish out, make better use of the space, and just you know store the the little compressor over in the corner. <laughs> Well, this, this one has like a bit in the front, in the in where where the engine should be. It has like a gap for putting these bits into. But uh, yeah, it's weird. And I, and I was, sort of, you know, almost like panicking about it because I've never had a vehicle that doesn't have. Well, I thought I'd never had a vehicle that didn't have a spare wheel. Hmm. I'm like, oh, you just, you know, if I break down by the side of the road, I've got to either assemble this liquid injecting uh, <laughs> thing, or I've got to phone the breakdown company, which I've never done, ever. Uh, um, and I was like, oh, I'm really bothered by it. My wife was like, but you've ridden motorbikes for years mm. that have never had a spare tyre. Yeah. And it's never bothered you. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it sort of hasn't. <laughs> 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 He's like, oh, yeah. When you think about it that way, yeah, no, I never have. But add a roof and it does. Yeah, for some reason. Which is actually better because if it breaks down, I can sit in the car. Yeah, Whereas while you're waiting oh, for the breakdown people to turn up. <laughs> yeah. And I've got a battery that will last me weeks. I was, I was going to say because that's the thing, isn't it? Is you, you've you've gone and done the sensible thing and switched to one of those electrical vehicles rather than one of those dinosaur yes, squeezing. I am I am now completely absolved from any blame in um, any form of environmental damage that the planet's doing. I'm I'm absolved myself from it. Well, yeah, but you say that, but you've you've made it worse being on the road because you bought a BMW. So it's not it's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no getting out of that. So you've seen you've seen Lord of the Rings, yeah, and and you know like how you know Smeagol becomes Gollum by being corrupted by the ring. That's a little bit what it's like when you own a BMW. It's it starts off fine and like you you like the power and you like the rear wheel and you get the handling and then slowly over time other people start, ne start neglecting to be your worse and worse at driving and. You start to get up behind them, and you just feel your hand going for the flash. <laughs> and it's yeah, it's it, it, it slowly takes you over. It's I mean, how many? I was just going to ask you: got a collapsible kind of yeah, indicator stalk? Does that kind of <laughs> collapse away? Uh, no, it, it has to be there by law. But obviously, we don't have to use them because we're better. Um, <laughs> and also. Uh, because uh, uh, it's an electric vehicle, if I don't use it, I get a few more meters driving. Of, of course, of course, yeah. yeah. So there, there are reasons for it. <laughs> I mean, how many weeks of owning the car before they call you in for the mandatory teaching you all the hand gestures and insults to shout out the window? And, and uh, no, Well, actually, when I got in it, I opened the glove box and I'm now an estate agent, so... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just, it just happens, but um, no, it, it, it's it's a cool car. It, all the the it, this is going to be really this is like this is like this has just become the the boring car show. But um, so it's well, we're, we're still in nerdy territory. We're fine, I think. Yeah. Oh, I've got a spreadsheet to show you how how good my car is. <laughs> um, so it's uh, BMW actually made a whole new production line for this car that mm. is carbon neutral as carbon neutral as a giant automotive company can be <laughs> industrial processing um yeah. and, it, and it's powered by wind and it's powered by uh solar panels and the hydroelectric plant and all that sort of stuff but all the interior is made from recycled materials and all of like the the body the sort of like your door cards and all that sort of stuff are made from recycled uh bottles like pet bottles and they'll have oh, like this rough feel in them and you can almost you can see the strands and the seats are made That's of vegan cool. leather, which we used to call pleather. <laughs> Faux leather, but now it's called vegan leather. Do you, do you know which, which... Is it a particular type of vegan leather, or is it is it just a... Uh, I don't non... know. I believe it's made... It's, it's not the one that's made from mangoes. I was going to say, because there's, there's uh, Pinatex, which is uh, pineapple-based, which is yeah. really cool. And there's, I... uh, there's another one that's made from mushrooms as well. Yeah, I think this is vehicle. just this is just a recycled plastic, like a PVC type one. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's it's, it's interesting and it's it does start to what if you've uh, previously I was charging up using public charging infrastructure, which was a little bit tense at times. 
Um, but now I've got um, my own charger at home. I've finished installing it. Uh, it it's... I had to go to the petrol station recently. And I sort of pulled up in, in the queue for the petrol. And I'm sitting there going, what on earth am I doing? It's like, this is the most... I'm sitting there and there's people in front of me and they're taking their time. They're going in, you know, filling up the petrol, going in there and choosing chocolate bars and making themselves a coffee and coming out and just wasting my day. <laughs> it's the B&W thing again. And um, I was like, I just, unplug, I just unplug my car and drive. Like I, I always leave the house with a full tank, mm -hmm. and it's it, and it doesn't take long before you get into that sort of like that that loop. It's quite quite interesting. Well, because it, it, everyone always goes on about range anxiety with EVs and stuff, yeah. and it seems to be that, that like we don't get range anxiety with you know driving a, a fossil fuel car, do we? You know, no. We because... find we we find a place to refill our car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, it, 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 it also people seem to misinterpret exactly how much driving they do. Mm. Like, I, I need a car that does 500 miles on a charge. Like, okay, well, when was the last time you drove 500 miles in one hit? Yeah, it's like you never have. Well, you, you may have, but you don't do it often enough to. It's like, it's like oh, no, this it's, car it's probably one percent of drivers who do that yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah, just and, picking and a random figure out off the top of my head. There, 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 there are cars that exist for them, but. Most people probably do less than eighty miles a week. Well, that's that. the thing, isn't it? Didn't they say that like the the average journey that most people do is, you know, like even like day to day commuting and stuff like that is still like under thirty miles. Yeah. Oh yeah, easily. But yeah, the people are just so obsessed with the idea that I must be able to drive. You know, my my parents live in two hundred miles away, and I must I must have four hundred miles worth of range to drive all the way there, and all the way back at any given moment. Like, do you? Like, when you get there, I'm sure they'll let you plug your car in and charge it up. And yeah, I mean, it's like, again. mine are 150 miles away from me. Hmm. But I, I, to get there, I have to go past 20 service stations, hmm. all of whom have, you know, EV charging points and all the rest of the stuff. And, you know, both my parents' houses have places to, you know, plug things in. Yeah, they have, they have um, blood sockets, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think that um, I think the, the, the main problem I, I'd have with, with that kind of thing is is just a capital upfront cost. Yeah. But then it, again, it, you know, like we, we bought a car recently that, that was it was cheap enough to be able to go and buy it outright. You know, it wasn't it wasn't something I was getting finance for or anything like that, you know. So it was like I think it, 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 once they get that kind of range of being able to just go Oh yeah, we can we can just go and pick one of these up, choose between either an EV or a, a fossil fuel car. I think then, I think that's when they're just going to be exploding in popularity rather than. Yeah, I mean where, where I am, they are becoming more popular just because of things they have like, to, the, I think, they? Yeah. like the ULEZ, where a lot of people sort of did the same thing as me and said, uh, "I'm not going to buy." I, I my car was not ULEZ ULEZ compliant, so I had to get a new one. Or I had to get a different for the car, benefit of those who don't live in London. Oh, sorry, yes. Um, the ultra low emissions zone, uh, which is a scheme by the mayor of London and the council of London to reduce emissions inside of the, a, the north and south circular parts of London, mm -hmm. um, which means that you can't drive pretty much any diesel vehicle that was built before 2016. And any petrol vehicle built before, I want to say 2000, but don't quote me on that. But um, yeah, quite a few people, when, when we had to go into ours, I thought I'm not going to get something, I'm not going to be halfway through paying for an, uh, a fossil fuel car, and then they suddenly yeah. move the goalposts, and then yeah. another car becomes valueless, and I have to sell it at a loss again. So I was like, no, bite the bullet, let's go electric. And uh, it's been it's been good, actually. It's, it's, yeah, it's I mean, you, you haven't you haven't been bragging too much. You haven't rubbed it no. in our faces too much. No, you know, uh, there was there was a brilliant time, there was a brilliant time when there when all the petrol stations were having a petrol crisis, and everyone was yeah, there was a, a little bit of yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, yeah. especially when me and Andy were stuck down south with uh, 
<laughs> struggling to get fuel to get home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was. I, I, did, I just start, for me. I, I had no fuel to get home on that particular occasion. It was just that you small did. matter of, oh, I'm stuck in this queue for an hour because there's a petrol station a mile away and there's no yep. way of actually turning around in this road. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wonder how many people actually bought petrol just because they were in the queue. They were trying to drive somewhere and end up sat in the queue for an hour. So we're just like, oh, let's just buy a petrol. Well, I would imagine yeah, because they use a quarter of the suspect. tank, just leave it, take it over. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of people didn't actually need to get fuel. No, they just kind of like, well, I'm here now anyway. I may as well get it. I, yeah, I'm, I might need to go out, and I don't know if there's going to be any fuel next week. So I'll, I'll just queue up and take it now. So anyone yeah. who might have needed it, really needed it, couldn't get it because mm. they'd run out. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. That's that's the uh, that's the way yeah. life is, and, and and that's something I keep bringing. I, I like to bring up. I keep bringing up when people sort of go to me. Like, what happens when you run out of electricity? I'm like, what happens when you run out of petrol? And you yeah. can't buy any at the petrol station because there's none left. <laughs> at least yeah, in my like mind, if I really want to, I can hook it up to a bicycle and <laughs> charge. So, solar panel on the roof. Yeah, cool. solar panel on the roof. I mean, there was a guy. Um... A couple of years ago, that had a, I want to say a Prius, and they'd, uh, you know, up in like some snowy place somewhere. I want to probably Canada-ish, and um, they'd got snowed in, and power was out, so they ended up just basically hooking the house up to the Prius, and just running the running the engine to just keep the battery charged, and then ran the house from the Prius. Yeah. There's actually genius. some uh, EVs coming out now that have got that as an option. Mm. I was so, I was chatting with uh, Kiel uh, last week sometime, uh, Kiel or two, and we were talking about the Ford F one hundred and fifty Lightning, yeah. which is they're all electric. And if you there's a couple of different versions of it. There's one with the extended battery and whatever. I think it's the one with the extended battery. I may be wrong. Uh, but it, it has bi-directional charging. Mm-hmm. So if you plug it into your house, it will run. Uh, yeah, it depends on obviously what load you put on it. But they say it will run a house for three days if wow. fully charged. That's... If you ration your electricity, it can run. It'll keep things ticking over for 10 days. So presumably if you're only using it for you know, your, your refrigeration. Yeah. And but... kind of minimal thing. You're not running all your... You know, air conditioning every possible outlet lots of portable heaters tumble dryer and the like then you probably get less obviously you get less but just mm. that ability to be able to kind of um, I mean yeah, I can't remember who it was now. one of the tech channels uh, a couple of weeks ago was talking about how it was comparing the benefits costs of getting a Tesla Wall versus getting an F one fifty Lightning, <laughs> and and their base, their base was well for the money and for the sort of benefits and whatever get get the Ford. Yeah, because you um, can't drive the wall. Yeah, so but it's a bit like those. Have you seen them? The, the Jackery do them. I don't know if we're allowed to say manufacturers' names. These are sort of like big lumpy. We're not yeah, allowed to sponsors. <laughs> Uh, other 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 big battery boxes are available. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's just a big big old battery that you can charge up and then sort of take camping for like three or four days. Hmm. And um, I, I I had a thought like oh you could get one of those you could run you could run, you could charge it up and then run most of most of the stuff that you're running now you should run off of one of those and I was like oh that's you know five hundred quid and how would you integrate that? So if you took that to work every day with you, charged it up while you're charged at work, work. <laughs> then unplugged it and brought it home, <laughs> how long would you have to go for before you broke even on that? Just, just or, or before you had to find a new job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it did fit under a desk. I don't think anyone would notice. You know? <laughs> Yeah, it's like slightly different from just oh, I've I've got one of the company pens in my pocket and I've gone home with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think given given what everyone knows about me and 
all of this. Uh, I think they would they they might notice me trying to sneak in. You know, three tons of battery boxes every day to charge them up. <laughs> Is it all the lights dim? Put handles on it. Call it Farmer's Walk. Tell them it's part of your exercise regime. You're doing a Farmer's Walk twice a day. A, yeah. <laughs> definitely get me back strong again. <laughs> Make yourself like. Have you ever seen Dragon Ball Z? Where they they have the suits and they've got all the. Um, the, the plates in them that are really heavy to make them stronger as they're walking around. Just do that with, with, with batteries. Just have them and then just sit at your desk and just plug in. <laughs> just, what are you doing? I'm wearing, wearing my normal suit. Just, yeah, just in this like lithium ion <laughs> weighted suit that's just plugged in by a USB into the front of a computer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, great. I've got to work 15 hours today just to charge this one. <laughs> yeah. Clocking in overtime on this one. <laughs> It's when one of them starts going puffy on you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Spicy through a Zoom call. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my shoulders extra warm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's when when one of your colleagues decides to prank you by putting some drawing pins on your seats, just like kids do at school sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Become the spiciest of all the pillows. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, if, if you're sitting down on the battery packs, you, that's probably not going to be the most comfortable thing to sit at for a work day, is it? No, true. <laughs> Depends true. if they shape to your buttocks or not. They shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> if they do start shaping, then you've really got problems. <laughs> oh. oh, crikey. We've been, going, we've been going for 32 minutes and you haven't introduced your podcast yet. You haven't done your intro. We don't, yeah, we typically go for an hour or more before we introduce. Oh, the okay, podcast. that's fine. I just, I, I didn't know if you'd. There's, there's some, there's some weeks where we don't even say the name of the person <laughs> until it's like right at the end, and they're telling us where their socials are. Oh, I, right. I suppose what we, what we should actually say is that you're not Brett, because we did say yes. last week that you were going to be Brett this week. But you're not Brett. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm. Yes, I'm deeply apologetic for that. <laughs> yes, for the benefit of those who were listening last week, uh, I did sort of say it was going to be Brett this week, Brett McAfee, uh, obviously one of the Fools of Tools hosts, uh, Skulls Page 13 from YouTube. Uh, he was supposed to be on today, um, but when I uh, reached out to him uh, yesterday to kind of sort of just check everything's all right and get kind of the pictures from him, because I normally do that on the Saturday, uh, it was like, uh, I kind of got to go to LA and I'm not sure I'm going to be back in time so it was like well we record live so we can't really just kind of put it off to the back I'm afraid so uh, let's rearrange uh, Catch couldn't you get next out of it. Time. Yeah. yeah so he'll be on hopefully with the other two uh, hopefully in <laughs> two weeks time when we have the episode we, 40 we shall... Fools with Tools yeah, we, we should confirm Check. when they either appear or don't appear <laughs> Yes, I mean it's to be fair. I know, best. I know. We normally try and sort of get the, you know, when we've got a group session, we normally get each member of that group session on individually first. But we have had, uh, we had Simon on, um, yes, before Simon had been on. So, you know, this wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> yeah, so we try, we we try and do, it, but yeah, it, this yeah. this is a. We're not, Every, we're not everyone who's got to this point in in listening to us knows we wing it at Hopefully, best. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I did discover. I did discover yesterday, after I put a post up on Instagram. All we, I always get we always get um, kind of here the, the classic spammers, some named account kind of going promote it on mm -hmm. such and such a promotion thing. And he said, "Sorry, I'm going to have a little chat to this one." Why? Why should I promote that? And well, we do good things for you know getting things. And we had a couple of chaps, and Andy kind of uh, uh, said a sort of couple of things. It looked yeah so kosher, and then I mentioned that we've got no marketing budget, and the entire oh. section of chat disappeared. Mm. It's funny that, isn't it? Yeah, Before funny. I even got a chance to block them, and so mm. I'm kind of hoping that next week there won't be anything up here because <laughs> I'll be on a, we'll, we'll be on a blacklist of they've got no money. Yeah, skip, skip podcast. Anyway. Yeah, we're not, we're not putting any money <laughs> into some scammers in marketing. 
it seems to be almost impossible to become blacklisted from scammers. I get probably <laughs> five or six uh, Instagram messages a day telling me I've won a new iPhone or yeah, uh, yeah. Johnny Allen actually yeah. had a, a he posted a story about how to um, blacklist the just one phrase they keep using in it so that Instagram doesn't show you. Yeah, you, you can yeah, do that. Or, that. Or, or you can try and get blacklisted by replying <laughs> to them and wasting their time. And, uh, yeah. If, if you've got nothing better to do. <laughs> yeah, a friend of mine does that with the... Uh... Uh... Sorry, go on, Andy. I was going to say, I get a lot of... Um, get the, obviously, the iPhone 13s are very popular at the moment. Mm. I've, I've won dozens this week mm. alone. And to get a lot of uh, foreign exchange or forex, crypto... Yeah, experts oh, yeah. who all seem to be about twenty three and, and, and mm. rather attractive, um, or some bloke standing next to a Lamborghini or mm. some other such, which they <laughs> try, try to, really to, invest, to invest in some new kind of coin. Yeah, that definitely, that will definitely exist next week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, Jamie, you were saying about the uh, the phone scammers. Yeah, um, the the ones who ring up about the. Uh, you know, the, the, the uh, car crash that you've been in and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, a mate of mine works for a, uh, a, a car company and has worked as a development driver for them. Uh, so, you know, driving all over the world in various vehicles and has obviously been in several little nudges and, and things like that. So whenever they ring up, he, he just goes, oh, really? Which, which, which one? Which accident? Like, oh no! The, there was the one last week in the uh, in the Z8. There was the uh, or the i8. There was the one week before in the uh, in the Aston Martin. Uh, there was that one in the uh, in the Jag. A couple of, couple of weeks before that. Which, which one were you talking about? <laughs> just, just keeps them on the phone for as long as he can. That, to me, that that's always the game. I I like to try and describe them the plots of films. <laughs> And see how long they'll go for it with. So they're sort of like, oh, can you, can you tell us about the accident? Like, oh, yeah. So I was with my friend at the um, the shopping centre car park. And I was showing off this new part, new feature of my car. And uh, anyway, some Libyans arrived uh, that I'd previously <laughs> had a problem with. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so, yeah, just like that, that sort of thing. I, I just love the fact that the second you mentioned Libyans arriving, the whole mental image appeared in my head. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the the best one was when I I basically described the the opening plot of um, uh, RoboCop, a, you know, machine gun. The guy's going, yeah, 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 and I went, and then and he goes, and then what happened? And then I, and then I was killed. He's like, what? And I went, I was killed, but it's fine because I'm a robot now. And you just have <laughs> silence, and then just click. <laughs> <Not having this. laughs> well, in in your uh, in your story there with the Libyans, did you uh, did you say that you got shot or that your friend got shot? Oh no, I was claiming no, I was claiming compensation for my friend that got stuck in 1985. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> not, yeah. not your tires catching on fire when you hit 88 miles per hour. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't have known about that because the car was gone at that point. But... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hopefully he would have put in the insurance claim in the past so that they would have known about it now in the future when they phoned me about it, which is obviously why they were calling me. But, I mean, it, you obviously. know, it, he wouldn't have been the, the owner and policyholder of the car, though, so... Uh, no, but he could have been a named driver. <laughs> a named driver of future policy. Yeah. <laughs> he could have, he could have taken out the name driver. He could have taken out an insurance policy for the car before I bought it. He could have been, I could have bought it off of him. Anyway, this is pointless. <laughs> but was it but, but was he 18 or was he 68? <laughs> well, I, or however I old because I can't remember exactly. Actually, I would imagine for the purposes of getting insurance it would be better to go into the future to get the insurance. Because then you'd be older and have more no claims, and then you could go True. back to the past and yeah. present them with a no claim certificate from twenty thirty five or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
It, I, you, you kind of wonder about You didn't think you'd be that. talking about time travelling insurance today, did you? Yeah. <laughs> I, had, I had somebody call up a, a while ago. Um, it was on the landline. And What's one the, of them? the number came up. For the benefit of millennials <laughs> and, uh, and, and Gen yeah, Z. Landline, what, yeah, landline, yeah. Like, yeah, a phone that's actually connected into the wall. Except it wasn't, because of course it was a uh, handset. Um, but I had this call come up, and the the area code, it, yeah, we had kind of caller identification on the phone. And the, the, the number came up, and I, I answered it. But I, yeah, I wasn't expecting a call. Obviously, the name didn't come up because it was an unknown number, but it didn't come up as private, so I, I picked it up. And there's kind of a little bit of a pause, which is classic. And then somebody introduced themselves as, their, as my local energy advisor. <laughs> and I kind of went, oh, that's interesting. Because you say local, I'm in Kent, which is you know, the, the southeast of the United Kingdom. You can't, you can't get, yeah, literally, yeah, fifteen miles as a crow flies. So my feet are wet in the English Channel. Mm. Maybe not even that far, to be honest. But yeah, fairly close to the, the, the corner of England. You can't get much further than this, like Jamie Page is right on the, the very end. And this number was coming up in Bournemouth, which is kind of on the south coast, but right in the middle of the south coast. So mm-hmm. yeah, well over a hundred miles away. So define local, because you're in Bournemouth. <laughs> and I know that because I, I used to live in Bournemouth, so I recognise the dialing code. As soon as I said that, it was just like, phone down. Mm-hmm. Like, they just phoned some poor of the sap. Can't get them to sign up for some electricity they don't need. It, it, it must, there must be a hit ratio. Because it, obviously they can... It, and things like spam emails now it, it's you know you can send out a million a day it's not not yeah. impossible but then there must be some sort of like hit ratio i mean there, there's people like us there's people you know who are much more tech savvy who don't even who either who either just dismiss it and it just go away or email back and start messing with them about the intricacies of time travel and car insurance <laughs> but there must be there must be some level of Actual effective hit ratio. That yeah, must be. Yeah, I'd, there are. I'd, I'd I'd love to find out what that what what the number is. Like how what is the the amount of emails sent to actual money coming back? Mm. It just yeah, it must be. be it has to be enough for it to, to for it to work. Yeah. And, and and well, it has to be enough to at least pay for the server. Yeah. Otherwise, it would just simply disappear. So that I mean, and that's this kind of sort of sad thing, really, isn't it? Yeah. But, but the worst, the worst is there are people who will do this. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, go out to scam people. It, it all comes down to money at the end of the day, doesn't it? You know, yeah. it, like a couple of us listen to Darknet Diaries, the mm. podcast, and here you can just go and like buy for for not much money, go and buy several million known email addresses or known phone numbers or contact detail pairs or you know things like that with uh name and phone number or name and email address that are you know known working um for like 50 60 quid you know not Ooh. not much money to get a huge volume of uh of user data it's it's worth it to someone one hit back is one hit back is has paid for that alone yeah, yeah absolutely yeah get half a dozen and you you you're laughing yeah. And all you need to do is to, to try a couple of those contact pairs in, uh, you know, in, in your local search engine and get some access to something somewhere and get some details yeah. you know, that you can pass on and sell on to someone else. It's, yeah, I mean, obviously I do a lot of that, that kind of stuff, IT security stuff through work and things, and it's, it's mind-boggling, the, the volume of information that's out there. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's crazy. It is. It, it, it is boggling, isn't it? I mean, yeah, the, the way that the way I mean, information alone. Mm. Yeah, it, it just I, I saw something a while ago was talking about kind of you know, people in the Middle Ages. The average person in the Middle Ages would essentially have as the amount of information they would receive. Is just what one a person nowadays would get in a, a day. 
Oh, your, your morning email blast. Yeah. And a, 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 a if you consider the compare like yeah, a modern newspaper for those who still kind of get them compared to you know the amount of information that somebody let's say in the this late 18th or 19th century late 18th century would receive mm. you know it'd be the, more words in a yeah a Sunday paper than they would probably read in a, a, a lifetime again unless they were rich enough to be buying books and things Ooh. yeah or or if you were in, in an employment that required you to have that understanding because I was watching um do you ever see a YouTube channel called Lindy Beige? It's, uh, it has it's... been recommended. It was uh, one of the attention grabbers for Rasmus, if I remember oh. correctly, on his episode. Mm. Um, he, he does like, quite a lot of like in-depth uh, sort of, like, examinations of different things, and he's done ones on sort of like medieval trade and sort of like how how the, how the process of it sort of works. And like you say, that not, not only does people have limited information, the information comes incredibly, uh, in comparison to modern times, incredibly yeah. slowly. So yeah. you could receive uh, um, um, I, 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 an, 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 an order for you know, 10 bushels of wheat being paid at so many gold florins, whatever. Mm. By the time that message reaches you, and by the time you've loaded up the ship and sent it off to the person, other ships could have arrived and affected the the value of the market that it arrives in. So then mm. those things that you were once promised a price for are now worth less. And obviously the person that is at that end is no longer going to pay for that. So they're going to try and send you a message back <laughs> to renegotiate <laughs> the price. <laughs> so you could end up with just you could end up with huge losses. Like losses mm. of your entire thing just over the fact that you know, another ship bigger had twenty bushels on it, and just crashed the price of bushels in that in that area. And yeah, you would never have found out about it. It's just absolute gamble for, for that kind of person. God, yeah, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling, really. Yeah, exactly that. It is to try and get your head around that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've we've. The three of us have grown up in in an age where you can communicate to someone on the other side of the world instantaneously you know and yeah. that's that's always been a way of life for us to think that there is a well i mean you two have grown up in an age i mean yeah they were, they were still talking about things like telstar when i was thinking there was you watch no, tv there, there was, yeah, from another still... country when i was a kid it was like there would be a delay when they were kind of still receiving the information yeah, but quite, there were, there were still phones distant. that would allow you to Ooh. to to connect. To, you could have rang Dan, for instance, in Australia. You know, Ooh. yes, there would have been a, a slight delay in the phone call, but you could have actually still had a, con a real time conversation yeah. with someone on the other side of the world. Yes, that um, is true. You know, as opposed to like now, where I mean, obviously the three of us are all in the UK, but we've had full, you know, real time high resolution video chats now which is now the norm for kids growing up today yeah, it, and it they, they won't be able to comprehend a, a world where that wasn't a thing to, to be able to have not not only to do that but to be able to do that you know i can i can walk down the road and have a high definition video call with multiple people globally mm -hmm. with z like zero effort <laughs> yeah yeah it's and even to try and describe that to someone from, say, you know, what, 1960s, 70s, when, like, you know, that, that was, you know, that's Dick Tracy's communicator watch. And you're like, oh, yeah. no, we've gone beyond that in a very short space of time. It, 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 the 1980s. If you just said that was something viable in the 1980s, people would have gone, no, that's, that's, that's science fiction. Yeah, yeah. It, well, the sort of things. If you grew up on, I mean, I, I grew up on Tomorrow's World when it was still in black and white. Yeah, the, 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 for the benefit of those who are in the UK or perhaps aren't old enough to remember it, um, there was a, a science program, magazine program on on the BBC uh, called Tomorrow's World, which literally did kind of feature, kind of yeah, this this is the latest advance in technology that we're going to be having in these liquid shows. crystal displays. Yeah, mm. and 
navigate. I think we linked one a uh, while ago wow. in the show notes, a navigation system that was basically a cassette that you put into your car and it connected to the the, the distance measuring system in the car, yeah, the, the odometer, odometer yeah. to switch on and off at different stages in order to tell you which turn to take next. Yeah. I, I love that that old analog technology where you know something physically has to be rotating to turn on the yeah the system it, it's just it is brilliant it's like, have you ever seen um the videos of like the really old lifts and the way that they they communicate with like the three like there's this sort of three um levers with wheels on the end of them and as they move up and down the lift shaft there's sort of like different points where these make contact with sort of exposed metal work on the wall and it makes contact and that tells you when to sort of stop and open the doors and shut and all that sort of stuff. It's like, I love, I love that, the, the way that, you know, programming was done by someone moving a piece of metal up and down a wall. Yeah. <laughs> inside of it. Engineering, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it works. And that's the beauty of it, isn't it? It's, I, I, I do sometimes wonder as well if we, we, we lose some of that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because obviously we're we're gaining all the time. Yeah, if you, if you think about you know, the, the power that's available in a, an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi, compare yeah. that to a yeah you know, a ZX Spectrum of the mid '80s or a even a, a, a PC from the early '90s. And well, you know, the power I've said before, isn't about is, is, yeah, that Dave's garage video where he's talking about the. Um, the, the computer that was in the, the lunar module, the, the lunar lander, uh, to be able to compare that to each stage, you know, it, it shows that kind of uh, progression of technology and, and like the, yeah. the level of computing now that's available in your hand is just a staggering amount of calculations. Far exceeds the, the entire Apollo uh, system. By... Absolutely, yeah. By orders of there's um, there's a really interesting picture, and I believe it's by someone from Hewlett Packard, and it's a picture of about twelve people and a lorry bringing in this hard drive into a building, and it's yeah, all on like wood, and they've got like they've got ropes around it, and they're sort of putting it in with like crannikins and and human labour, and it's huge, and it's four megabytes of yeah. data, and it's like and yeah. the, the the caption is just this picture would not fit on that hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> and just, just, just to think about that, it's just like, yeah, you can't, this, you could, this picture would not fit on that hard drive. Well, I, I, uh, not to sort of jump across to attention grabbers, but I, I, I had a couple of visitors this weekend in um, our, our former guests, Duncan and uh, Simon. And, um, I introduced them to a video from oh, was it like 2012, maybe. No, but it that must have been even it's been earlier than that. But it was by Fujitsu, I think it was. Or oh, no, Hitachi. Um, that's when they were doing the micro drives, and they they had come up with a new way of getting high density storage. And what they did is that they released a song, uh, which I will dig out and add in the show notes because it is a beautiful earworm that everybody needs to experience. <laughs> but it was um, it was uh, talking about the super paramagnet the super paramagnetic effect that happens to hard drives and uh, when bits get too close to each other and how they uh, lose their magnetic um, storage. They, inter they, they interfere with each other. It, you, it's, yeah. it's a similar principle you get in um, one flips VHS the next, or the next. Yeah, yeah, you get in VHS or, or or um, audio cassettes, if you leave them wound too long without playing, yeah, the, literally the, the, the magnetic dipoles on one layer will affect those on another. Exactly. So you get degradation of this, your, your recording. So the, th this was just, you know, like a, 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 a song video that they'd done about how they'd reconfigured the bits on these micro drives to, to make them perpendicular rather than longitudinally, uh, you know, around the, the platters. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, it's it, that's that's going back time, and you think like that was you know groundbreaking when they when they managed to do that to 
to to jump it up from three thousand songs to be able to store thirty thousand songs. Wow. Well, know, that's that's still not much, you know, by today's standards. Yeah. You know, I was looking today about there was uh, someone was talking about uh, some controversy with Synology and how they're, they're some of their new things are the lock in to make you buy their drives rather than you know industry standard drives. And this guy was talking about these twenty terabyte drives that he was putting, trying to put sixteen of, twelve of. Uh, 20 terabyte drives into this desktop NAS unit you know that, you, that was colossal colossal amounts of storage data storage mm. it's just, it, it, it is problem. crazy and and not only that being able to process and do stuff with that yeah just at, at a domestic level I mean I I I, I don't have at the moment I don't have a particularly big sort of like workspace but with a computer and a 3D printer, I can produce unbelievable amounts of, like, you know, precision manufactured plastic components are, yeah. you know, 10 clicks now. And the other thing is that is so crazily affordable. You can, you can yeah. get into, uh, it's one of them, the, the 3D printing is just, it's just, when, when I, first sort of like started going into like looking into it i a, f a friend of mine printed off a load of parts to build one of the the very early rep wrap machines which is sort of like a um a mendel type yeah mendel type with the you know the pcb heat bed and lots of yeah. and he printed loads of the components for it on a stratasys <laughs> which was like which is an industrial industrial grade really from tens of thousands of pounds yeah well, he, they actually got theirs for free. Um, it was, it was, it was. I can't remember exactly where it was. It was in either a university or some kind of industrial manufacturing area. And there was a prototyping machine, and it was going in the bin. And someone recognised what it was and sort of rescued it. And uh, it was, it was at the London Hack Space. And so, the, I, I never actually got around to finishing that printer, but I had all these components, and they were printed using this. You know, thirty, forty thousand pound Stratasys machine to build this printer. I never actually got that finished and got that working. But then the next printer I got that was working was the Anet A8, mm. and it was a hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> it's one hundred pounds, and you are manufacturing components to pretty high precision. Yeah, on your desk. Mm-hmm. For a hundred pounds, <laughs> it's just, I mean, don't get me wrong, the ANA is a garbage printer, <laughs> but and a fire hazard, <laughs> hey, yeah. Well, actually, I never had a fire issue with my ANA, I never had a single overheating issue with my ANA. You had every my, other possible issue with my, your ANA, though. <laughs> my much, much more expensive AnyCubic 4 Max Pro, the <laughs> flagship machine that they manufacture, that came with. No profiles and no user information that they completely ignored <laughs> that nearly caught fire. That is a fire hazard, but that's yeah. a story for another day. Um, <laughs> no, the the ANA is, and it was you know it, it was a box of parts and stuff, but it was a, like a hundred pounds. Uh -huh. it, it, how can how have we reached the point now where you can get that? From like you know, I don't know. What what, what else could you buy for a hundred pound? A vice, a set of files. A hacksaw. Uh, you're almost done for a hundred quid there. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, and if you go, uh, if, if you go, stuff, if you go for good quality files, I don't mm. think you need to go for particularly good quality. A hundred pound is in today's money is not a lot of money. No. Right. I mean, obviously, it is depending on where you are. To some people, it is an incredible amount of money. But yeah, to most, it's it's not. Well, in in terms of your your, your average Western world. Down the shop buying supplies and tools. Yeah, yeah, yeah hundred quids. You know, you, you come away from somewhere like Screwfix or Tool Station and have spent less than a hundred quid. You think you've done pretty yeah. well. Yeah, come on, with just one carry bag full of stuff, and that's yeah, yeah. hundred quid. But it, and and it, it's amazing because it, it, it is a completely level playing field. Mm. It, yeah, it, it doesn't matter what you know, 
who you are, if you've got a 3D printer and I've got a 3D printer, we are level. Mm. We don't have we don't have any you know I, I might be more big and physically stronger than you and I could carry a big piece of wood and saw through it and all that sort of stuff but maybe you can't but in that respect it is completely level and a- anyone can compete in that sort of field it's 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 changing that that whole thing and we're yeah, getting it's, stuff it's now it's changing the it's changing the goalposts from being uh it, it's it's accessibility isn't it you know mm. it's it's changing that from it, a, a person having a, a Two thousand pound printer versus a person having a two hundred pound printer. The only difference between those is time and input, and mm. that's the difference. Then, isn't it? It's not. It's not a skill set or a money thing. Nope. Th- those two people with an order of magnitude difference in the price of their printers can then both print the same file, mm. and it's just okay. One might need to tweak and tune theirs a little bit more, or maybe sand the part. A little bit more afterwards because it might be slightly out of dimensional accuracy compared to the other but you can still both end up with functional parts doing the job at the end of it yeah for, for an order of magnitude difference in in, yeah. in parts and the other crazy thing is you don't you don't even really need a lot of cad skill no. to do it you can you can you don't you can need any it. if you want for 3d printing yeah and there's so much available yeah I mean, there's a good probability that you search for whatever thing that you are about to try and draw. There's a good probability that someone else has I, already done it. I, I have this thing all the time with Duncan. Well, it, it, Duncan and I quite often have this kind of same chat where I, you know, it might be late at night, and I've just I've just remembered I need to do a thing that I need to make a bracket for something or a holder for something or something. I I, I end up I fire up. 3D CAD package of choice and start get me measuring tools and I'm sort of measuring the thing and then I get you know a good 20 minutes half an hour in and then remember that there's an entire selection of websites that are filled with resources that you can pre-download and then usually shoot Duncan a message message just sort of going yeah done it again you know <laughs> found it on Thingiverse with a 30 second search instead of 30 minutes of prep for CADing it all up and yeah invariably spend another three hours redrawing the thing that I downloaded from Thinkiverse because it was shit. But that's another story altogether. <laughs> You've got the thing. That's all that matters. <laughs> but it, yeah. <laughs> Starts to check all the same dimensions because it's still wrong. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is that though. It is, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a good probability that you could live with a 3D printer and never have a CAD package. Yeah. Oh. For, you know, but it, it, the thing that really interests me in terms of like you say you can get uh, yeah I, I mean I can, I've talked about before how you know I can still remember getting Christmas presents such as you know a, well, I've still got my fret saw yeah good old fashioned mm-hmm. hand based fret saw you know it's a, a 12 or 14 inch frame you know so you can cut things and that, that was with a marquetry set yeah so that was the project so yeah let you on your know, boxing day or whatever you know clamping the 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 little sort of peg like a jeweler's peg to the mm. coffee table in the front room and you know cutting out bits of veneer that they'd supplied and you kind of you, know, you sort of drew it out with a paper template and then kind of cutting it out and then sticking it together almost like a sort of jigsaw with a bit of wood glue and yeah there's i never i, I built that i still got the fret saw and i've used it you know, dozens of times hundreds mm-hmm. of times maybe probably dozens to be honest or scores um yeah it's, it's one of those things it's very useful sometimes to have a frame that, that that's that deep for cutting when you want to sort of cut something because you can you can clamp any type of kind of you know, like a scroll saw blade into it mm. but I, I never went out and bought another pack of veneers and, and made another project you know i made other things using it but i never really sort of did that and so there was, kind of, although there was, it opened up the possibility for other things, but I think the thing with a 3D printer, particularly, is that it really opens up the kind of the imagination. Mm. And as long as you've got a supply of filament, you know, cause I, I see this sometimes with kind of you, know, you get given if you have kids or you, you, you as a kid you get given kind of you know, make your own candle set. There's only so many candles or bars of soap 
that you you want your kids to give you as kind of because they've made this <laughs> bar of soap and it, it's maybe yeah it's a bit sticky because it's not very good quality soap but yeah it's nice and you get the first one but it's like after the sort of third or fourth you kind of go yeah and that they end up just kind of festering on the side of the, the sink because you just still end up using the sort of carex but with something like a, a, a 3d printer with some filament it completely then yeah the imagination opening mm -hmm. that i think any other kind of sort of tool combination doesn't necessarily give that's not to say there aren't kids particularly or, or, or people who are kind of you know, grabbing a, a saw and some files and producing some amazing creations but i think that the capability to free the imagination using a 3d printer is is, is beyond i think the, the, the main difference there with between those things is the uh the raw materials you know you you, hmm. you give someone uh a saw and some files and some chisels and a screwdriver and a drill and and sort of say crack on make some stuff and they're gonna have to go and buy multiple different types of wood yeah and store you give yeah and store or, or you, you know you're not necessarily going to just go and get a tree and turn the tree into your finished project. Mm. Whereas with the 3D printer, you've got that roll of filament that can be absolutely anything. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, you know, you don't need to go and get some big, wide, flat bits of filament and then some thin, long, dimensionally accurate bits of filament and then some. And then, and then pass those pieces through a thousand pound piece of equipment to make them into a different shape. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it's just it's one machine. It's one type of you know it's, it's the equivalent of a, a, you know a MIG welder, isn't it? It's for mm. the metal world. But even then, you still need to get raw materials to use that MIG welder on to weld them together. The and the other tools you need. Just... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, okay. I, I, I mean, I guess I think with things like a MIG welder, you can. I mean, I, I keep seeing sort of people talk about it, particularly like in the states. Yeah. You know, a company such as Send Cut Send, who mm. will kind of you, know, you design something, you you send off your tools, uh, your your tooling requirements, and you, a couple of days later, you know, you get oh, a parcel right, with yeah. everything already cut. You just need to then hot glue it glue together, together with your MIG Ooh. welder. But you probably still then also need the grinder to get that finish right. All, all of which require you know some amount of physical strength, physical capability. Mm, Sk yeah, skill space. In, space skill yeah. in handling those tools and the other thing is, is just is the potential for personal injury as well mm. which you just don't have with a printer which means you're more encouraged to like especially with you know um children and young people if you mm. make a mistake in a cad package oh no <laughs> You know, it's just the undo buttons it. for, or yeah, undo yeah. or delete, or just just plain start again. Um, you make a mistake with a grinder, there, there's there's the risk of you know serious personal injury, and, that, and that, mm -hmm. that's not to say people should be dissuaded from doing it at a young age, but for a lot of people, that's not something they want to do. Yeah, you know, for, for for us at a younger age, all right, yeah, we've seen the guy using the the angle grinder, we want to have a go as well. And you know, so we did, and all that sort of stuff. But to a lot of people, they look at that and go, "I don't, I do not want to go near that. I do, mm. I do not want to take part in that burning spark flying activity." And yeah. um, you can go if you want to make something here. You sit down at this computer, and there's a mouse, there's a keyboard, and just go at it. Click, and click then, when, when you're finished, think? press Control P, and it will come out of that machine over there. <laughs> And it, it, it is getting to that point where the you know the print the, the domestic printers are almost just fire and forget sort of things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, especially once you start getting into you know octo prints and and all that kind of stuff for uh, for being so set it and forget it kind of things. I mean, something like an Ender three out you know it's, it's out of the box put together and printing within what two hours. Hmm. Well, yeah. even the, the Sunloos that um, Andy and I have got, you know, they were, well, I think, six bolts. Ooh. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. And yeah. again, perfect level playing field. 
I've just I've just invest invested in a resin <laughs> printer, which is in I've had FDM printers for years. This is the first resin printer. It is a nightmare. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and you've owned it, ain't it? Liquid and <laughs> oozing liquids and washing and hand like gloves and handling and PPE. It's just it's he has crazy. PPE and kosh and <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've got I've got a Kosh cabinet now in my house. Yeah, I've got a full <laughs> risk assessment and data sheet. Um, for the, again, for the benefit of those outside the UK, Kosh is care of substances hazardous uh, to health. Control of substances control. hazardous to health. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a... Uh, a government legislation on how yeah. you uh, procure and keep um, chemicals that are hazardous to health in uh, a work or public use environment. Can you tell I work in health and safety? It's very dull. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very dull. But um, yeah, it is. It, but it is. That's oh, it, you know, when, when you're so used to an FDM printer, you wait, wait for the bed to cool down, pick it off. Done. This is yeah. The, wor the worst thing you're going to get is maybe a bit of support material jabs under your fingernail when you yeah. take some plastic off, or you slip with the um, with the card scraper thing to get getting it off the bed and like, catch your finger or something. Yeah. Or you touch this, you touch the nozzle while it's still hot. Yeah, and you get a blister. Yeah, but they, this this is like a whole, and, and I'm paranoid about the the, the resin because they're like, oh, if you get it on your skin, it'll it'll create this uh, dermatitis like thing that makes you mm. react to UV light and the sun, and you're burned to death, and you're like a vampire. Once you've touched the resin, you are you have uh, what is what is it in the Elder Scrolls? They call it the um, it, something. Demonic hemophilia or whatever it is, where you're know, going out and something just burns you, and um, it can yeah. cause all sorts of really, really horrific stuff. Yeah, yeah. And I really hope that breathing it isn't one of the bad things because I did that. <laughs> this... I think maybe just don't do it too often. No, yeah, I've done it. Don't I've done do it once, and I can assure you, we are not doing it again. So I, I got the printer out of the box and I put it on, you know, on on my desk. <laughs> I was like, let's do some printing. And it's got this it's got this little filter inside of it and it says oh you know it, it sucks the air and blows out um clean fresh air that is perfectly fine to breathe in, but may have a small smell of resin in it which is <laughs> a enormous lie because it absolutely stank out my house for like six hours while i printed this test print <laughs> off of it and i was like no you are now you are banished to the loft you are banished to the loft and i will do all my printing in there where it's well ventilated be gone, smelly machine. Yeah. Oh, and then once once you've got the part, you have to like chip it off the bed and put it into the water. I, I bought water soluble resin because the rest of it is all you have to have. You know, you, at that point, you need to buy buckets worth of isopropyl alcohol. I'm, like, mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. I'll, I'll rinse it in water. And it's like what, you know, what I would say is, don't rinse it down the sink though. No, just because it's it water washable, it, it doesn't yeah. mean it is. Environment. Yeah, you've got this. You've got yeah. this whole another level of like stuff you've got to now deal with. I've now got water that's been saturated with resin that I now have to do something with, and like, yeah. and no one tells you what to do with it. Like it's not in the book. Like, no, the book no. like, you know, wash your print off, and then great print done. Bye. No like problem. one of the things that like uh, Mike's mind does it, whenever he uses the, the water washable or or even standard resin, if he, if he's got like a load of you know, uh, what washing fluid, I suppose it would be, um, is just leave it outside for the yeah. all the, the water to evaporate. And then you're just left with this, like, stuff you can just chip off and dispose of. But even still, you then, like, got to do stuff with it still. Yeah, yeah you've, got the, you've got the... So what I, I've been I've been putting it into, like, old lemonade bottles and then putting that in the window and hoping mm. that the UV will set Secure. whatever resin's in there and it will yeah, fall sure into it the bottom. Yeah. And I'm hoping that will work, but... I, I don't know, and yeah, and then and then you've got to make yourself a curing station with a UV lamp in it, and which I've done, which is like I'm, I got myself an Amazon box, so other um, evil companies are available, um, <laughs> the, and then I've covered the inside of it in um, silver foil and with a little mm -hmm. sort of like solar powered spinning thing, and then I've got this. It's for it's for um, curing uh, acrylic nails, mm -hmm. like, which is and so I was like okay and. I put it in there, turned it on, and it came on for like a minute and a half. 
and then went off. I was like, oh, that's that's no good. It needs to be on for longer. So I turned it on again. It just went on for a minute and a half and went off again. Oh, this, is, this is ridiculous. Anyway, so open up the case. There's a little control circuit board in here. Oh, yes. I'll remove that control circuit board and remove this timer that's definitely there just to annoy me and from there for no other reason. <laughs> put it all back together again. Put it in the box. Turned it on. It ran for 10 minutes. And then there was like this burning sort of smell. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, it turns out the reason you can't run it for longer than a minute and a half is because all the LEDs overheat and just melt themselves and that's the end of that so i'm now waiting for a new uv uh, light <laughs> to put in my box <laughs> it's almost like they've tested this before yeah it's almost as if like someone who knew electronics better than me designed the circuit and designed all the things and it went off after the amount of time that it takes it doesn't destroy the machine but so that's cool down. yeah what, what what am i to know it, it's it reminds, i used to have um an, an old 250cc Honda motorcycle and I used to do all kinds of things to try and make it go faster and go faster and go faster. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the, the real answer was get a bigger bike. But yeah. that was not going to happen. And um, my, my granddad was an um, automotive engineer and I'd sort of go to him and go, I'm doing this, I'm going to polish the inlet and exhaust manifold. And he just went, there are teams of incredibly qualified engineers that design like in japan that work for honda that designed that engine to do exactly what it does very very well uh -huh. why do you think you know better <laughs> i was just like yeah but if i buy yeah. this other exhaust <laughs> the man on ebay says it'll give me five horsepower <laughs> so, yeah. and it, turns, and it turns out that the, the reason there's a timer on the light because it burns the lights out Going back to 3D printer, we've got a question from the chat. Alan's asked, what 3D printer would you suggest for a novice needing to make cogs, and small parts, and small miniature model making? Now, uh, you two are no far more bad. I, I think I've got, I know the answer, but I'll leave that for you to... Well, it's definitely going to need to be a resin printer, I think, for that, to make small it... miniature stuff. I, I well, built my mm. resin printer for the exact purpose of manufacturing tabletop minis. Yeah. So, that, that, so they are very good at that. Yeah. Cogs, why? Cogs and gears, wise. I don't know what the resin's like for that. So that, from what I do know about those, is uh, getting them to stay flat and planar is difficult because yeah. um, you don't tend to print resin prints flat to the bed like you would with a, an FDM. So you would tend to, if you've got your bed horizontal, you would tend to print something on an angle, supported. Uh, and then there is off opportunity for it to flex as it prints. Um, and I think either way, you'd have a bit of a tough time. Well, as for gears and cogs, though, depending on exactly how small you want to go, I mean, you can obviously fit a, a 3D printer with uh, an FDM, a fused deposition modeling filament printer, with quite a small nozzles down to like a 0 0.2 millimeters. So you can, uh, what you can also do, say what you can, what, what an one. alum of the podcast has done, our good friend Ali from Geeky Fire Art, ha, um, got a Japanese nozzle, very, 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 oh, very, yeah, very tiny that. nozzle, and they printed some awesome little tiny figures and um the only thing it does do is limit how or it limits your choice of filament mm. because some filaments have particles in that are bigger than the nozzle diameter but um i there are so when it comes down to gears i have actually the uh the rear derailleur on my mountain bike the one of the the plastic nylon gears that came with it actually disintegrated through misuse and um, <laughs> I needed to replace it and I was actually able to 3D print one in PETG and that's been on there for two years now yeah I remember when you did that and has actually yeah. sort of like survived through it so if you're looking to produce like gears that are going to be under relatively hard use I'd say an FDM printer but then for yeah. minis and like tabletop stuff like little tiny models a resin printer is going to be your thing. So you, you kind of need to balance out which one of them are you going to... Am I, am I printing more gears or am I printing more minis? 
it, it's whether you're doing lots and lots of small journeys around town or whether you're going to be uh, driving to your indoors 200 miles away every week. This is true. <laughs> this is true. But um, oh, for, for, an F, for an FDM printer, I would say, like, my, my advice to everyone is the Ender 3. It's not yeah. the best. But it's a great starting point. It is a brilliant starting point, and it has an enormous knowledge base, mm. which means that any problem you come up with, five seconds of Googling or another search engine. Um, DuckDuckGo is available. Yeah, DuckDuckGo <laughs> is available, or AltaVista, or Lycos. Um, <laughs> you can, you will find Jeez. someone, someone they, are, they are so prevalent. They're like the AK-47 printers. They are so prevalent. <laughs> Whatever other assault rifles are available um you whatever issue you've <laughs> Plastic had off do make other pattern uh, yeah, they make actually they make umbrellas which is really weird <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah whatever problem you're experiencing someone else has experienced it someone else is much more knowledgeable and they will be able to tell you exactly how to deal with it there'll probably be a video on how to deal with it and, and certainly they, much more knowledgeable than us lot <laughs> okay, yeah 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 i only know how the other three is quite cheap i've broken so many <laughs> Yeah, Enders are a great recommendation because yeah. um, they're ubiquitous, I, I, they're inexpensive, and there's loads of options for upgrades, yeah. tweaks, and changes yeah, to I'll any any situation you want to go yeah. down. And, and I know people who say that if you've got the budget, a Prusa will give you more out of the box. Yeah, but it requires the the same tweaking if you're not that interested. They're, they're the same people who say buy an Apple because you don't have to do anything with it. It, it's it's a different tool for a different thing. Yeah. If you if you want something that you can take out of the box and use as a tool and then switch off and forget your own, then yeah, yeah a Prusa is great if you can spend the money on it. But you won't get any better print out of a Prusa mm. than you will out of an Ender three. You yeah. might have to spend two hours setting the Ender three up, you know, to tune it in. That you might only have to spend twenty minutes on the Prusas to do the same thing. But when they both break. They both break in exactly the same way. You both have to replace the same parts in both of them, but one then costs a lot more to replace the parts of than the other. So, the, the, if you've got any technical nows, the, the Prusa machines, I've, I've when, when I've looked at them, they are they are very well made. They are really nice. Yeah, of course they are, but they are also very expensive. Yeah, uh, and, you're paying for the uh, ecosystem and the support and yeah and profiles. They, thousand pounds plus for for an art for a, whatever they whatever mark three, they're, uh, three mark three yeah whereas an ender is i think i've seen them as low as about 260 270 so well, it's, and, and the threes so depending on where you're looking you can buy them for about 200 quid yeah but which means um, you can get it if you if you love it you can keep going with it if you don't you can probably put it on ebay within a week and for 150 and you know you've not lost a lot, really. Yeah, I, I mean it, it's it's one of those that with something like FTM three D printing, you're either going to take to it and then find people to help you out when you run into problems, or you're going to not get on with it at all. Ooh. You know there are there are people who started three D printing on resin printers and have tried FTM and and can't get on with it. And there are people who've tried FDM, have gone very deep down that rabbit hole, and don't go near resin. You know, it's yeah, it, it's yeah, it, it, it's um, there are so many resources out there. But when it, when it comes when it comes down to the, the resin printers, which one to buy? Any of them? They're fundamentally all the same. They're Ideally, strict... one that says mono in the. Uh, the description for a mono a mono screen yeah but, but they're, they're all the, the modern generation ones yeah there's there's not a whole lot in it other than than bed size but again it, it, the bed size is a little bit like you sort of you sort of everyone goes oh i want i want the biggest bed possible i want you know 250 by 250 it's got to be and i want about to print a full cube of a kilo of resin. So like, yeah but i would say most of the things i print are probably 100 mil <laughs> 100 mil across occasionally it's something big but most of the time it's quite small and like when i look at the resin printers now oh, that's not gonna be big enough that's not gonna be big enough and i'm thinking, I'm thinking yeah but if i print like five D D minis they are 25 mil high by 25 mil wide but 12 yeah. of them on this bed and it's only this big <laughs> it's just like 
yeah, this Honestly, I mean, I, out of all of mine, I mean, I, I've got, I've got four FDM printers set up ready for use, and th those bed sizes range. In fact, I, I could plug in the fifth, but you know, if, if we've got the the smaller, like my, vi I've still got my very first 3D printer from 2016, and that's still perfectly functional, still fully operational. That's got the smallest bed, and that's 130 mil in each direction and um, the biggest bed printer i've got is 310 mil by 310 mil by 400 mil i've never printed anything that that size i've i've printed things that are 300 mil wide or 300 mil deep or 340 mil in one direction that i printed on an angle diagonally mm -hmm. across the bed i've printed things that are 350 mil tall but I've never needed to print something that's that full cubic volume in no. in one go. But it, and it, it's, it's not that difficult to break up something bigger if you want to build make something bigger. It's no, not absolutely. that difficult to split it into smaller parts. And then you have to obviously learn the skills of joining them together and maybe making it look seamless. But it, it, it's very doable. Yeah, I mean the, the printer I use more than any of the others is two hundred mil bed size and and i probably just use the middle 100 mil square <laughs> section of that yep because <laughs> most things i'm printing is just you know like I, I might print four parts of something and i'll print them one at a time in the middle yeah because it's just it's just easy <laughs> yeah so in, in answer to your question look within yourself and choose the thing <laughs> you feel would be best <laughs> for you but, res but be aware that resin is not just a printer. There is a whole. You're going to need many rolls of kitchen roll. Resin comes water, with brushes, gloves, masks, goggles, all the extra stuff. Yeah, so. that's the that's the price. Obviously, FDM prints are relatively eco friendly. You can get recycled filaments. You can get recycled schemes on filaments and yep. rolls. Um, a friend of the podcast. Uh, Callum Cole, uh, yep. he 3D tomorrow. He 3D tomorrow. Yeah, he. Um, Other filament supplies are available. They are, but they're not as good. No, he. Um, they're, they're, to be honest, their filament is amazing. 3D tomorrow. They are really good. UK based cardboard spools, um, super yeah, eco friendly. They do eco re eco filaments and stuff. Um, so like really really. Easy on the environment, or is it easy on the environment? Especially with things like PLA. Yeah, because yeah. PLA is is not petroleum based. No, it's starch based. Yeah, um, and that's the thing. You know, it, it it can be really low impact, low environmental impact. Whereas then, when you move across to the newer resin technologies, and you then have to, you know wash and cure and mm -hmm. all of these things that are then using other hazardous chemicals uh, things like isopropyl alcohol and the resins themselves and then having to use vinyl gloves because you can't use latex gloves because it, nope. the resin will eat through it and you, you then get into being aware of exposure yep. issues but yeah being aware of exposure exposure then you you know your uv curing your respiratory health your the, there's so much more involved that is less good for the environment and less good for your personal health but it's a nicer print yeah you know it, it's that kind yeah. of trade-off it depends and, what you want to do with it and 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 for the i've, I've printed off several little sort of D, &D scale minis and it is in the, the phenomenal print tiny quality. detail is just unbelievable and the 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 the, the, the surface finish is just crazy but yeah but god it's a lot yeah. of work it really is a lot of work and that's the thing. I, sh I should acknowledge my my bias there in in having um, several FDM printers and not having any resin printers uh, it, uh, by active choice. You know, mm. I could definitely make use of resin printers, but um, I don't have anywhere to. You, you need space yeah. to work. You need. You know, I, I I can have my printer next to me. Yep. I can be using it while I'm working. Reach across, take the part off the thing, and then finish it while I'm working things. It, you know, whereas actually, you couldn't do that with a resin. It, it reminds me a lot of, have you ever, I mean, Andy might have done this, have you ever developed photos? 
a few times. It, it's really <laughs> similar to that. Like, it's yeah. like a whole, you know, you've got to set up the environment, you've got to create that, you know, your safety light and your dark zones and your light leaks and all that sort of stuff. And then you've got all of your chemicals that you've got to use in order and not transfer between the two and all that sort of stuff. It's like, it's, it's got that real similar feel to it when you're working with the resin print. Yeah. Mm. And, I, yeah, having spent many, many hours in dark rooms, I, I know there's, there's, there's kind of a resurgence to kind of film photography again. Mm. And I can kind of understand that. I mean, it, it's probably only six or seven years ago since I gave away my last... I think I've got a couple of compacts hiding up in drawers somewhere uh, or up in the loft. But I gave away my, my SLR, uh, which I had when I was 16. Gave that away to the school I was at, I think, seven years ago, something like that. Eight years ago, certainly within the last 10 years. And I kind of miss it. Yeah, it was a camera that I, I, I kind of learnt my bulk of my photography skills on. I, I really loved the camera. It wasn't it wasn't a super expensive camera. It wasn't even yeah, it wasn't one of the big brands. It wasn't you know Nikon or Canon. It was it was a Shinon CG5. A beautiful camera, absolutely gorgeous to use. I really liked it. It felt nice in my hand. I, I yeah, took loads of rubbish photos, but I took some good photos too. And I kind of miss a little bit of that, but now yeah, I I don't tend to use my DSLR very often just because of the the, the weight of it. I tend to like most people, the, the best camera is the one that you've got to hand, and that's normally my phone. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, yeah, I've got a more compact little Sony now. That's yeah, a gorgeous little camera. Uh, I've still got my, I've got two digital SLRs. I've got a stack of lenses. I love taking yeah photo, photographs. Do I want to go in a dark room again? No. Give me Lightroom. <laughs> give me Photoshop. I can take on a digital camera. I can take yeah a few thousand photographs at a time, mm -hmm. rather than limited to thirty six or however many rolls I can put in my pocket. There's no cost for the development. There's no yeah I can reuse that SD card mm -hmm. thousands of times. Yeah, I think I'm, I have no idea how many photographs are on my computer that I've taken since I had a digital camera. My first digital camera, I think, was probably around. 2000 2001 maybe it, it it's it's in the hundreds of thousands mm. I could never have afforded to to process all that even if I did it at home the, the amount of chemicals just for getting the negative strips yeah the ease with which you can do things and I think I think f for me I, I don't ever envisage going down the resin 3d printing line. I've seen what you can do. I think mm. it's great, but for me, the, having that requirement, you, you basically have to have a lab mm. or a lab area where you can keep those things. You can have good ventilation. You've got, you know, the right storage facilities to keep it safe because you have exposure to chemicals. I'm a physicist. Yeah. I, Okay, I'm yeah. a science teacher as well. I can do chemical stuff, but I don't really like chemicals. I think that's yeah. the thing. You, you can do it safely. But you it can. Is, yes. It is much more involved yes. than FDM is. Yeah. Yeah. The risk factor from the materials is significantly mm -hmm. lower with FDM unless you're playing around with some of the perhaps less common more adaptable, more exotic filaments. Some of those can have issues, I believe. Yeah, I mean, again, it, it, it's it's a time thing, isn't it? You know, because you, you look at um, ten years ago, three D printing. Most people would have been printing ABS. Yep. And that's that's something you don't want to print in an unventilated room. Um. And over time, it's got less and less common, and maybe over time, resin prints will get much safer to use much less uh, problematic uh, you know it, it's still a relatively new technology so it's you know they, all of these technologies go through that same kind of cycle of you know uh, improvements and uh, safety aspects and things like that so and cost changes I, I, I can 
again, as, as the technology changes, yeah, will there be mm. a, a time in, I don't know, 10 years time, five years time, where your resin printer will be an enclosed system, there will be pots of the chemicals, yeah, you literally just kind of install your your new resin when you kind of, yeah, it runs out, and you, you do a print, it's all a completely sealed system, it it does the it does the job. It does all the bits for you. Yeah. All you have to do is at the end separate off your supports. Um, I think I think that's it, where it, that's where like domestic three D printing will become the big thing. Is once that once that once it is as user friendly as your desktop normal two D printer. Yeah. Which I know is something. <laughs> <laughs> I I no I I have contemplated before now. Cadding up a 3D print and then 3D printing a document because of it being quicker and easier than trying to wrangle with an obstinate 2D desktop printer. There was someone on Twitter a while ago. Um, I will I will find it and I'll give it. I'll give you the link to the um, the show notes. He um, also oh, they uh, they had to write a letter. It was I can't remember. What, it was to cancel a service of some kind. And they would not allow it via email. They would not allow it via phone. You had to write in. You had to write in. And he said it doesn't have a printer. So he laser. They, they laser cut. Um, sort of like an A3, like laser engraved the letter on like an A3 sheet of laser ply and then posted it to them. I, I, I don't know whether they um, whether they, they, they got a reply or not. But yeah. It's... Well, it, I did, yeah, it would be... 11 and a half years ago or so now, when I left Costco. Um, I used to work in Costco down in Bristol. And when I left there to move up here, um, I sort of handed my notice in and the uh, the person in HR who was sort of would have processed that, she said to me, she's like, I need it in, I need it in writing. It's like, well, what, do you need me typed up or handwritten? She went, I'll just, just scribble something down so I've got something in writing. So I, I did exactly that. I, I went and I had a, a big black permanent marker and I went and found tore a big massive chunk of cardboard off a box. It was a big old, you know, weirdly shaped chunk of just hand torn cardboard from a from a, a big cardboard box and just scribbled on it in big, you know, kind of forty mil high letters. Sorry, I'm gonna be leaving it effective this date, blah, 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 sign Jamie. And took it to her, you know kind of two-handed walked it to her and then there you go <laughs> and she just burst out laughing i, I mean it's have, exactly what you asked me for <laughs> have, um have you ever seen uh, or, or heard uh, this uh, comedian mark thomas and he does um he did he did a, a whole sort of like mini series of about the uh, serious organized crime bill which is in the uk it's a bit it's basically a uh, a law that was passed that any um protest that you wanted to do in within a certain area of central London you had to apply for um, a, a license for the, the day and the time and what you were doing um, but there were no specifics inside of it as to the size of the protest so each, each he set the Guinness World Record for the biggest amount of individual protests happening at one time so he got about I believe it was about 250 people who all individually submitted their own uh, application to form their own protest, but at the same time as everyone else. And um, one of the people in that realised that at no point did it say that it had to be the application had to be written on paper, so that they iced their application on a cake and then presented <laughs> it. And because it has to be presented at the police station, so they presented a cake at the police station. <laughs> And so the desk sergeant was all had to sit there and, and copy down <laughs> what was on the cake. And then someone else um, came in and they said that it wasn't them that was protesting. It was the ghost of Winston Churchill. So they demanded that they had a seance to bring him through so that he could make his application written through like that. So, and they did it all through like automatic writing. It was quite, quite fantastic. Often. I love those kind of time-wasting things. It's like you, you see it quite often in the States with you know, disgruntled people paying 
parking fines or speeding tickets or whatever by taking a you know wheelbarrow full of one cent coins to to the police station or you know things like that. You just think, just surely there are better better ways to spend your time. But I'm no. glad you did it so I can see it. Yeah, <laughs> no, there is no better way to spend your time than wasting the purposes of someone else's. <laughs> I mean, you guys have had a whole podcast based on that for how many episodes now? Well, exactly. <laughs> 38. Yeah. yeah. 38. 38 times. Yeah, most most podcasts by episode 38 will have done 38 hours. I think we're somewhere in... How many hundred? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's got to be triple figures. over 100. It's got to be. And, and you know, we've, we've just got to think that we've got a few subscribers on the channel as well you know 231 subscribers so we we must have wasted you know at, at least a handful of those for a, for a good 100 hours or more I, I, that probably uh, have you got the youtube studio app and you can actually check and it will it will give you breakdowns of like the demographics of people that are watching and well cuz cuz a lot of our guests and like me included I I've got the uh, the stream up on another screen anyway so I, I will be swaying the demographics slightly to the uh, mid thirties beardy. <laughs> yeah, but I have, it, look, I have looked at the data. I have looked at the data a couple of times. It's, I mean, it's we're not. I think altogether, last time I checked, considering we started in June, we had something like fifteen hundred hours of watch time. That's pretty good. We, yeah, That's just is, one person which, running through it. Which is pretty good, yeah. I mean, you're, you're kind of gunny, though, because there's probably a huge amount of people that just put it on in the background and then just listen to it and have it as background noise. So hmm. it's, it's easy. And then and then YouTube will just auto-play the next one. So. I have to, Actually, I heard something interesting the other week, and I don't know how true this is. Um because this is certainly something I've done in the past. It's kind of like, I'm just going to put something on in the background mm-hmm. and listen to it. So, yeah, I'll, I'll often if I'm at this, if I'm at the laptop, if I'm sort of doing my drawing or something, I'll, I'll just put some music on. Um, but, yeah, if someone's working on the computer and you kind of put something on and you have it, you know, one screen, you have a video playing and you kind of work on something else on the other screen. And I've, I've heard that if the... If the video is not on the active screen, mm. it doesn't count the time. Mm. Now, I don't know how true that is, because if that's true, then there are a lot of people missing out on a lot of hours, because that's going to be a common thing to do, to kind of, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm writing some reports here. I'm just going to put on yeah. my watch list of videos on the side, supporting my favourite channels. I mean, you can see exactly that... that that reason exactly is why they would potentially do that you know Mm. because you you could very easily sway it so that um someone has yeah the four thousand hours of watch time or whatever it is a year to to qualify one thousand one thousand subscribers four thousand hours of watch time in the last 365 days is the the kind of yeah i mean realistically i could set that up to Mm. be done from this house mm. for for any given channel you know a uh, thousand subscribers thousand unique accounts and get in four thousand watch hours not a problem at all mm. um but to that that would just mean you know instant monetiz- monetization for yeah. people so you'd absolutely want to clamp down on that for, for people gaming the system you know if yeah you, you would absolutely have like we talked before about those like boards filled, filled with mobile phones mm. where you've got like a you know 12 by 12 sheet of plywood that's got a load of previous generation android phones just hot glued to the board and like a load of cables running around to having them yeah. all permanently on and you, you get people you know in in uh countries where the uh you know the, the the hourly wage is low enough to be able to do that where you get people stood there for eight hours a day just poking the screens and playing the next video or clicking the next button on a game or stuff like that and if they've if they've got a hundred phones in front of them 
it's I mean that that's your watch hours for a YouTube channel, isn't it? Which I suppose realistically you could still do with with active uh, with active you know uh, yeah. screens playing. Yeah, it, it's weird. There, there's actually uh, there's actually someone in my area that kind of does something similar, and every now and again you spot them and they sort of go around and they have the best way to describe it is like is like a tea tray with multiple mobile phones attached to it. Mm-hmm. And I've never been able to get a good look at what's on the screen, and I've really tried. And like, I think they're playing Pokemon Go. I was going to say, Pokemon Go so is coming for that. They are either hugely dedicated to Pokemon Go, or there is some kind of their their selling accounts or something like that, or 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 with, they may even be doing like data harvesting for someone like Google. You know, go, go into locations and checking off. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a, I've seen a couple of things like that with uh, Pokemon Go and the the game that it was actually based on um, Ingress. Ingress, yeah, where people would do that kind of thing. And if you've got someone who's unable to go out and do those that kind of things, like you know, go and stand in a Pokemon gym or or things like that, to be able to um, essentially rent a human to do it for them. And they do that as a service, you know. People who, who they, they go out for a walk every day, so they'll take someone's phone with them to get the steps to, you know, yeah. hatch a Pokemon or or things like that. I mean, um, I know, I know. Years and years ago, there used to be a, a market for um, the buying and selling of World of Warcraft gold, and yeah. the buying and selling of World of Warcraft leveled characters. So mm. yeah, it's all it's all possible. Well, I know that there was the other one that uh, a guy was really frustrated with. Um, a particular section of road constantly being populated with cars. Uh, so what he did is he got a load of mobile phones, um, set them all on Google Maps, and then put them all into like a little, you know, the little uh, pull behind hand trolley things, hand cart things, uh, and then just went and walked very very slowly across this bridge. So to Google Maps uh, and the the traffic things yeah there was a there was a load of slow moving traffic there was a traffic jam so it rerouted everyone's journey around this bridge um you know things like that so it's just try and game the system yeah but yeah i can't i can't I, I, one day i will i will get a decent look at what's on that screen screens and i'll find out i, I don't know what they're doing but I, yeah. i'm guessing it's either, it's either going to be farming pokemon go or it's going to be some kind of uh data adjustment or data um, what would you call it quantifying for something like Google Maps going to like address to address and checking off the, the, the accuracy yeah. is where they are it's so it could be something like that but yeah it does it does weirdly exist in not not just out in you know Far East Asia within sort of farms but yeah on the streets of London yeah there, there was um, do you remember the, the war driving stuff yeah. that people used to do and that, that's that's going back a time now, but um, yeah, made the money to do that. For, war driving is a uh, what people would do would be you know to, to travel around an area with um, active Wi-Fi scanning and would be uh, okay. checking yeah. for open Wi-Fi hotspots and things. And there, there is a, a an ongoing project that um, was linked with Movo, I think one of the. Um, one of the GPS manufacturers, you could export all the data for that. So there was an there was an app that you could run. Again, I mean, this is going back two thousand eight, maybe back in the Windows Phone days, and you could just drive around with with your with your your thing sat in your in your car, and it would just it would just search around all of the uh, the the, uh, the Wi Fi hotspots around the area. And it would then log them all on the GPS route. So you had this, you know, this kind of like ping radius um, of people's SSIDs and what type of security they had. Um, so was that specifically for like data mining, trying to get that to hack yeah. people, or just not to necessarily get, to hack people, or just to get free Wi-Fi that you can? Use well, so this is the thing: is it, well, not necessarily that, but you could have things like people who were on BT, for instance, if you have BT Broadband, um, if you're on BT Broadband, you could then access other BT Broadband 
routers essentially. Yeah. You'd you'd act, you'd log on to their kind of guest network if you like, and when you yeah, put Virgin your details in, same. Virgin have got the same. Um, so it would allow you to harvest all that information, ready for um, whatever use you had for it. You know, and a mate of mine got me into it. I said back in around 2008, something like that. To just you know drive around the area, just as, as you on your commute to and from work, it would just pick them all up and log them in the GPS. Uh, we used to we, we quite... used to do it trying to find just just trying to find open internet connections to get mm. to get a connection. You used to used to be able to sort of spot oh that's a that's a link sys. So let's just try admin admin. And, oh, that's, yeah. that's a D, that's a D link. Let's try um, let's try admin and password <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, where, where they used to come with sort of default. Default passwords and that one, it was used to be have a go. Yeah, I, I mean, I had a, a bit of a background of doing that kind of stuff as well. But um, yeah, getting in and, uh, and adding security to people's networks and then just drop them the, the WPA key through the door and things. <laughs> so I was walking home from work three weeks ago, and as I'm walking along, I, I, I you know, you sort of. If you're the certain kind of person, your eyes just sort of like go towards things. And I just mm. spotted a BT Home Hub sat in someone's front window with the password and everything facing, oh, facing out. out. Oh, oh god! And you know, we just like, I, uh, if I've spotted it, I can't be the only person. Someone needs to do something about this. Mm -hmm. So, it's like, what can I do? So, like, do I write a letter and just like put it through the letterbox, going like, you know? Thanks for the free Wi-Fi. I, I've or, changed um, your Wi-Fi password. <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, no. I, what what I what I had to do? I had to go. I sort of stood there for a minute and I right, we just went in there and just changed the name of their changed the name of their router to "Please move your router." <laughs> 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 and, and then sort of left. And, and and I walked back past there three days later and it was gone. So. <laughs> I, they were probably quite worried, but also glad they moved. Hadn't, to hadn't twigged, yeah, yeah. Because it's, it's just that, that's not sort of like you know operational security is just so. I don't know. You don't even think about it really. You just sort of like oh, I'll put it there. That's where I get the best signal. Yeah, I, well, I mean, it, it, this is obviously I've, I've been doing this for years. This kind of thing, you get people who, um, you know, everyone's master socket for their incoming phone that, line I was is, just thinking is, that that's going to be it's next to the front room window oh, yeah and it's and it's often right near where you put your telly because they'll also have the aerial point will be right next to it and the sockets there so most people will end up with their their nice big flat screen tv and then their shiny flashy box full of lights that is really annoying so they put that behind their tv and then they ring me up saying my wi-fi is terrible can you come and fix it <laughs> Yeah, I'll put it in a cupboard. <laughs> Cupboards are fine, but yeah. putting putting a, a Wi-Fi router behind a big metal panel in the corner of your room, <laughs> and then wondering why you can't get internet at the other end of your house. Yeah, you know, wooden doors of a cupboard, perfectly fine. Big metal shielding panel that you've <laughs> them not so much. Like, how we can only get it when we sit in this seat. I'm all right, yeah. Let's just yeah. move the router from behind the big telly, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, but we can see the lights. All right, give me a, give me a permanent marker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll some electrical tape. There we go. <laughs> like, yeah, but the, now the aerials are in the way. That's why we've got Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> get Fine, just live like that, then. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I have that constant problem with, with in my mum's house because my dad insists on having the Wi-Fi router next to his computer, which is sort of like upstairs in one far corner. They mm. spend most of their time in the kitchen, which is downstairs in the opposite far corner. And he's like, and she goes, well, Wi-Fi is really slow. And I'm like, move the router. Mm -hmm. well, we and just move it literally to the middle. Your house is a square. Put it in the middle. <laughs> We, there's better Wi-Fi in your front garden than there is in your living room, <laughs> <laughs> and, and and it goes round, it goes round in circles and that sort of thing. And he's just like, and you need to go, fine, 
just live like this then. <laughs> just do all of you do all of your Wi-Fi in the hallway. I, I, I'm bored of trying to explain it to you. But the, the ridiculous thing is, my dad is um, he's a uh, what is it? He's a engineer of the national board. No, what's it called? The national board of the, the national institution of engineers. He's an electrical engineer, so he should know better. <laughs> And he, he, he worked for years at the post office. And one of the things he worked on there was um, the research and development for the uh, the camera systems that read your um, postcodes and then translate them into a series of uh, ultraviolet dots or phosphorescent dots. Or something phosphorescent on, dots, yeah. On, yeah. on post. And uh, yeah, as, as a child, all the engineers' children were basically given these sheets of paper with the alphabet, like a, a squared piece, with the alphabet in the top, and we had to write the alphabet in our bad children's handwriting on the bottom of it. <laughs> and they used it for training the the software to read Fantastic. awful handwriting. We had to write all these different postcodes and stuff and send it through. So, yeah, my, my crap handwriting is the reason that your post gets to where it should be. <laughs> <laughs> there, was a, there was a brilliant... There was a brilliant little... Uh, a, a series of experiments. I can't remember who the hell did it now, but um, they were doing like um, cryptic puzzles for the addresses, and then just sticking them in the post. Because if if it isn't if it isn't machine readable, it's then passed on to human interpreters. Yeah. So it was that process of you know like doing creative image cryptic mm -hmm. puzzles for for what the address would be uh to see if the if the um if the letters turned up yeah and they, they had some fantastic ones and, and the posties were then saying that they really enjoyed it because it was something different it was a it was a nice challenge to work out where this letter was going to be going and, and things like that whereas like you know a, a lad that i went to school with his uh his sister when she was at uni um they were just trying to send what was you know the, the most ridiculous thing they could send through the post um i think she won with a tuna sandwich that she just basically made a tuna sandwich put it in a jiffy bag and sent it in the post yeah this is unpleasant when it arrived a couple of days later yeah I imagine yeah <laughs> we'd be it's, yeah i mean as long as it fits through a letterbox there's no reason the con the contents doesn't matter i, I mean I, it does. There's, there's a thing on oh. the Royal Mail with what you can't send. I was about to say, I was about to say um, when you go and post something, they always ask you, like, what's in the package? There's been a lot more of that the last six months. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm a terrible person for that. Like, what's inside? I'm, like, I'm not really in the surprise. And, um, <laughs> or I'll just, I'll just try and get away with like, putting the most unusual thing in the description. Unfortunately, it doesn't show up on the, um, on the, on the label at all, which is mm -hmm. annoying. Unlike the, you must have received like the China Post ones, and it always has like these bizarre descriptions. Customs declaration. Yeah, yeah. and it would, and it would yeah. say things like electronics, or uh, in the past I've just had, I've just had sort of like it just had um, exotic fabrics. You know, like, I order. <laughs> you sort of open it, and it's like it's, it was a phone sleeve. I'm like, okay. <laughs> So there's there's a um, depending on what you're ordering and where you're ordering from, there's an app you can get on your phone that will allow you to because like we all know that you can you can get barcode readers for your phone and it uses the phone's camera, it reads you your normal standard vertical barcode, one D barcode, um, and then obviously now with the, the people are more and more comfortable with QR codes, which are two D barcodes, um, but there are other forms of barcode type data that are ubiquitous and all over postal stuff. So you have things like uh, matrix codes um, and data lattices and things like that that are readable with the right apps. So you quite often get, you know, when people have posted something online and they've scribbled out their address, mm -hmm. but then left the QR code and the data matrix and the, um, you know, the other, the, the information there you can quite yeah. easily just scan it with the app on your phone and get like the sender's address the recipient's address the contents of the package when it was posted where it was posted from you know there's yeah. a huge amount of data on these things yeah the letters and words are really only for the humans yeah absolutely mm -hmm. yeah the machines yeah. don't care they, they they 
get all the information from a data matrix and that's it yeah but we don't we don't realize just how much information we freely give out to people yeah although there is a certain point where you just sort of have to stop worrying about it oh absolutely because you otherwise you just become you just become a, a tinfoil hatted so mad I, I i have this conversation fairly often and by fairly often i mean a, a good few times a year with people who are becoming more stressed or more paranoid about things like information security and the main problem is it's firstly understanding just how how much information you passively give away without realizing and then how of how little significance you are in the real world and that's the that's the cognitive dissonance because you in your world are your world and you in your immediate circle of people are hugely important but you in the grand scheme of things as an individual in a population of 7.8 billion people are one of 7.8 billion people yeah. and the the unless you are dramatically increasing your, your the size of the target on your back you're just a relatively insignificant number in terms of data security and mm -hmm. all the rest of stuff Yes, your, your average Instagrammer might get hacked at some point. Yes, your average YouTuber might get hacked at some point. Yes, your average Facebook user is going to get you know, a phishing attack. But it's going to be um, a, a blanket, wide-cast net. It's only a relatively small number of people who are going to get a spear phishing attack where it's targeted or yeah. get someone actively trying to breach your account, specifically yours. It's it's you know it's it's the same difference between like you know you you lock your car, not to prevent someone getting into it, but to prevent someone easily getting into it. Yeah, and same with house security. If somebody exactly. wants to get into your house, There's they can get can in. To stop them. Yeah. Absolutely. All you are trying to do is to make the majority of burglaries in in the UK are opportunistic. Exactly. Occasionally, of course, you see in the the, the, the media about you know some footballer or, or whatever whose house has been targeted by mm -hmm. things but as you say they're the people who've put that target on their back they've got the very rich things they've got the the jewels or the, the yeah. diamond studded watches and the like and so they have become that target for the average person in the UK in an average house with average stuff it tends to be opportunistic mm -hmm. the the the, the next stage up from that any kind of targeting will be things like I mean, we, we certainly get the problem down here in, in Kent uh, things like uh, mini tractors uh, quads from, from farms mm. and uh, not, uh, lawn mowers the, the big lawn mowers because yeah. they're, yeah, they're, they're often stored in outhouses they're, and, and trailers that. Yeah, those things that are easily moved on, yeah. but quite expensive, but tend to be left outside. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, people come breaking in. If you, if you lock your doors, if you keep your windows closed, yeah, in summer when you go out, most people are going to get targeted. Yeah, but I interrupt, talk about yeah. data. What we, what we get around here a lot is um, people trying car doors. They'll just, they'll yeah. just walk down the street trying the car doors. And if one opens and they can get two pound in change out of the middle cup holder, mm -hmm. that's that's their night. And it, it, like I say, it, it, and that is that is it. They exactly literally there is someone yeah. just walking along, trying email addresses, trying that. Most of the time, you are just not interesting enough to hack. And that's that's exactly it. And that's the thing that people don't realise of like when someone goes, "Oh my god, I've been hacked." It's like no, you you, you haven't been hacked. Yeah, you haven't been actively targeted. Unless you've done something to really upset someone who's actively targeting you, you've been passively caught in a net because of something that you had that was lax or because of a link that you clicked because it just so happened that someone you've not spoken to in six months randomly sent you a link on Facebook Messenger to go, oh, well, I've seen you in this video. Are you video. in this video? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've all had that from um, uh, uh, 
a middle-aged relative who's not particularly tech savvy yeah you know it happens all the time because people go yeah. oh what's this click oh uh, this looks like the facebook site i'll put my facebook details in mm. oh why have all my friends suddenly started sending me text messages saying what's this link you've just sent me mm. you know it's things like that that it it's 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 locking your door it's it's not leaving a laptop on the seat of your car and going in to grab a sandwich it's it's those kind of things that are um it's that passive casting of the net and you're just getting caught up because of a misstep or yeah. a, a, a misunderstanding you, you're not actively targeted because you're not interested enough and mm. realizing that you're not interested enough as an average person i think is the is the biggest bit of cognitive dissonance you know why have i been hacked what have i done it's like you, you just made a mistake yeah you, you just didn't understand enough and that's fine do do this do this do this and then you're fine don't use the same password on every single one of your accounts and have that same password that you used 10 years ago you know there are these services like have i been pwned where yeah. you you go on there you put your email address in and it gives you a list of all the data breaches that you've been involved in and almost everyone who's a professional and has had a professional life for at least the last 10 years has been caught up in the linkedin hack mm -hmm. i i regularly get an email through uh to my old company um when i had the it business uh, i get an email address come through to that email address which is still active with an old password in the subject heading and that's because it was the password i used on the linkedin website at yeah. the time linkedin was hacked the, the the entire uh database of usernames email addresses passwords personal information was all swept up wasn't properly encrypted salted and hashed and all the rest of stuff um and it was breached and it's only a matter of time and then someone can just go onto the you don't even need to buy it now you can just go onto the website and just download the entire 13 gig database or whatever it is with a list of names addresses phone numbers email addresses passwords that are known to be linked to that because they've mm -hmm. been tried and confirmed working uh, or have been taken from live breaches you, you can find all this information out and it's all really available you can go to these websites like let's say like have i been pwned or this, this um security website that does the same thing you can put your you can type your password in and it will tell you if that password has been leaked online you know if you've got a really secure password that is not one two three four or password <laughs> or password one <laughs> or password two um or password with an at sign instead of and a password with a capital p and an at sign and then a one and an exclamation mark you know, all of these passwords that are you know the ones that everyone uses Th these are you know you can type you can type in that password and it will tell you whether that password has been leaked online and it will tell you how long it would take for the average computer to crack that password and it, it is shockingly quick shockingly easy and quite a lot of them that are because what they tend to do when they're doing you know like a, a trying to breach an account is they can just download that website and then breach it offline and then they know that they can then breach it online with the right details yeah. um, and just log into your account so if they're actively trying to hack you don't make it easy for them you know if you've yeah. got that target painted on your back hopefully you, you're going to have things like multi-factor authentication um and using different passwords for every account that you have online and yes yeah. i mean every account you have online yeah you know if you've got a facebook and an instagram and myspace and bebo and face party and netlog and all of these social media accounts use a different password for each one of them don't yeah. use the same one for all of them and don't use the same password for your amazon and your ebay and your bank and your email address because then all they need is is that password once yeah. and they've they've entirely taken over your life yeah um, i mean they, they're gonna once, once they found like you know it's, it's what you find a key you're gonna try it in every door yeah absolutely but it's as long as, long as you've got some you know them uh, your, your chaotic good friend around who will who will do things to you 
that force you. Like, <laughs> I, 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 like you, you know that my favourite is always the uh, the old Hunter Two thing where you go, you go onto the WhatsApp group and you go, "Did you know if you type <laughs> in your WhatsApp password or Facebook password into WhatsApp, it blanks it out? Look here, and then you just put a line of uh, asterisk." <laughs> Yeah. And almost immediately, five or six people will just put their password in and send it to you. Mm-hmm. And they'll go, oh, but don't know. It's like, now you have to change your password. <laughs> or I'll change it for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. You know, but that, that's just exactly trying to it. It's, it, it, you know, it, I mean, I, I'll put this out there now for, for anyone who's listening who wants any advice about that. Just send me a message, you know. Um, it's, send me it's, a message, including your email address and your password <laughs> yeah the um the 16 digit card number yeah. uh the cvv off the back and your uh, your postcode yeah. perfect um <laughs> mother's maiden name exactly first car you drove or you know but, but that's that's exactly it and that whole thing with hunter 2 for those not familiar with the story was um yeah, sorry, yeah. back in the back in the day early early days online on a bulletin board where someone said exactly that they said uh did you know that on this website if it, it's smart enough to know that if you type your password for the website it will uh convert it all to asterisks look and then they typed just a line of asterisks and then sure enough someone was daft enough to type their password in that just happened to be hunter 2 and then five or six other users um had all put asterisks in and they said look even even if we copy your line of asterisks and send it back to you, it'll convert it. We can't see it. We can only see asterisks, but you can see the password. So then, loads of people then typed back Hunter Two to this user. Um, just of course, you know, winding them up. But then it's become ubiquitous in uh, you know in IT circles and the kind of cesspools that Andy and I tend to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Frequent yeah, that 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 one not <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Andy P not um, Andy P. <laughs> I, do you know what? I, I don't I don't know who I'm pointing at because I don't I don't I, I know I'm pointing to Andy on here on my screen but I don't know what yeah. that's relative. Yeah. Oh okay. Yeah, it should be good the same for all of us. Yeah, it's good to know. It's a bit yeah. like being on University Challenge. <laughs> See, so I always thought for I years way, I thought I thought they were on split no, levels. Same. And I wonder I why people asked. didn't drop things down. Yeah, I, I yeah, because it makes sense. Yeah, <laughs> that's how it's always presented. But yeah, no, apparently. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, side side. I suppose to not non UK viewers, there was a there. It, does it still? Is it still on? Yes, but it, it, it's sort of seasonal. I don't know if it's happened in the last couple of years. Obviously, because of the obvious, yeah, you know, the human malware. Um, yeah, but they're they're they're, they're socially distanced above each other, surely. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, it's, it's, yeah, a, it's within the teams, but it's a it's yeah. a, a television game show, where quiz show, in, quiz show. a quiz show rather yeah. than a game show. Because yeah, there's no real prize, is there? No. Glory, that that, that, Glory. They, oh, I no. think that is yeah. simply the, the, the thing that yeah. And, uh, university teams tra- compete against each other, uh, answering yeah, knockout, incredibly complicated questions, mm. uh, and and it's presented as if the two teams competing are. In like bunk beds above each other, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, and they're not. It's uh, it's a clever <laughs> trick of the camera because, yeah, like you say, for years I thought they were above each other. It, se- it seems the sensible thing to do, yeah. If you want to have them presenting on a, a, a screen, yeah, they stick them. You know, what happens? But now, of course, with most things are widescreen. I mean, when, it, when University Challenge first started, yeah, it was on the kind of the old four by three essentially square screens mm. so it kind of yeah fitted with the idea of four people in a team two teams one above the other it kind of fit on the screen now of course yeah most people have got wide screens so you can have them so side by side the camera, yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> weird one. no one of the weird british tv quiz game show things they're like countdown which they're back if, they, if I, I haven't actually got the chat open i don't know how many people what is the sort of demographic of people non-uk viewers what time are we going out in the u.s uh eastern standard time we started at 4 30 in the afternoon okay so mm. they might be might so 2 30 kind of oh, I, can't, I can never remember how many time zones are on the states Two kind of, uh, yeah three five or seven three i think 
I think Australia's got about 15, hasn't it? And like half hour increments and <laughs> yeah, we, we have we have a whole bunch of weird TV games, including one where people solve anagram problems and maths problems to win a teapot. Yeah, <laughs> it's been running for almost 40 years. It's a good show. It, it's a very good show. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it for ages, but it is one of those things because you can take part yourself. Yeah, you can. Yeah, and uh, you know, a lot of these. I mean, I, I think. I mean, for, we, we've. Uh, so in my uh, my fam, the rest of my family really quite like the uh, Michael McIntyre BBC uh, quiz program called the the Wheel, um, which is a bunch of celebrities who are kind of assisting three one of three possible kind of members of the public to win money. They've kind of you get a prize right, mm. you get money. Uh, or goes into the pot and eventually whoever answers the last question ends up with the, the contents of the pot hopefully and it's kind of yeah, it's constantly kind of you know, kind of going oh yeah that's because oh. it, it's it's a bit like who wants to be in there for most of it it's four possible answers mm. and some of the questions are so obscure there's, there's no way you can, unless you really know your subject inside out to kind of yeah, know yeah what percent, what exact percentage of people who took a survey in 12 years ago thought of such and such another thing <laughs> yeah it's, some, it's some really obscure stuff I think, I think, I think, I think quiz shows are good I, I, I used to watch yeah. a lot of quiz shows as a kid I think I think the, the, the best one and, and and it was it ran, it ran for a, a fair while but it was bullseye mm. which is a darts based quiz show um, that is quite funny. And it's just a, it's just a very, you know, there's no real losers in it as such. Like everyone, everyone gets an opportunity to win the big prize. And obviously, if you didn't, then they sort of they they'd show you the big prize anyway, just sort of rub it in. But fam famously, people used to win sort of like speedboats and things. And, yeah, you know, live several hundred miles from the sea <laughs> or any body of water. Yeah. Or of course, have you ever seen Indoor League? Is that the one that's basically like tag? No, no, no. Oh, it, it's from the seventies. Okay. Oh, right, okay. And it's basically people playing pub games in a <laughs> great big league for very small amounts. I think the, the ultimate winning prize, I think, fifty quid. Like that. <laughs> um, a lot of money back in the seventies. Uh, yeah. yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, pint of beer was less than 50p. But you would have had to have arm wrestled probably 12 people to get to that <laughs> one on, on, on TV. And and it's presented by this 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 old-fashioned cricketer. And the way that he presents it, his very thick you know, Yorkshire accent. Um, and he, he is just there in a cardigan. He has a pint and a pipe. And every time it cuts to him, it looks like you've interrupted him. <laughs> it's just like, oh, now we're going to go over to here and look at this person, and they're going to throw some darts. Now, fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, and it was just like people playing darts, or people just playing these really obscure, like, pub games. One of them was like was cheese, uh, like cheese bowling, where they had like these wooden wheels of cheese, and they had to hurl them at Skittles from like a distance away. <laughs> and, you the mini version of that with Baby Bell. Yeah. But yeah, I'll, um, I'll, again, I'll, I'll find. I'll see if I, there must be an, there must be episodes on on YouTube. I'll, I'll send you a link to it. Yeah, put it in there. But yeah, yeah it's in, cool. indoor league, and I can't remember the name of the cricketer now. But yeah, it's just proper sort of like uh, uh, I'll 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 see you later, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but he just he's always just got, he's got a pint and a pop, and he just looks like you're interrupting his day every time it cuts to. <laughs> Well, you are you're interrupting his pint, his pint. Yeah, you are. You literally are. <laughs> oh, but fantastic! But, uh, I mean, some of those, I mean, some of those game shows, which is, I think a lot of game shows are really just a lot of them are variations on the same thing. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where you kind of go, yeah, you've got to guess how many, how many of the audience, or how many of the general public will have answered this question, and yeah, you know, can you get the least? Can you get the most? Or whatever, it's kind of sort of variations on sort of general knowledge, and trying to sort of sort things. I think some of those sort of challenge ones. More interesting. It's like the Krypton Factor was a great game show. 
Um, for those who don't know that, it it it, it was the it wasn't just one from... thing. You had uh, multiple challenges that the contestants had to take part in. Physical Very challenges and mental challenges. Yeah, so they were yeah. literally they they go and run an obstacle course, and who could get around quickest. And then there'd be another one where they would kind of, you know, uh, yeah, how many, how how quickly can you cycle on a stationary bike, you know, the equivalent of a, a mile or, or, or something. Mm. And then there'd be, you know, trying to, you'd have to answer questions. There might be a series of maths questions or a series of general knowledge questions. And then there'd be the kind of, right, we've got this dexterity type task. So you're kind of trying to move a, um, rem- say almost like that operation game. You kind of try and remove something. Yeah. And you, you must or touching a, a a a wire with a a connector, and if it buzzes, you're out. Yeah, things like that. And it was it was certainly when I remember it when it was first on, it was it was really quite uh, different to anything else that had ever been. Mm. Like, I think some of the, it got rebooted. And I, was, I did see one or two of the reboots, and it was just like, nah, it's not the same. That's just kind of an age thing, I think. Was it? Was it? I want to say Richard Madeley at one point. Might have been. Might have been. It was a very different guy. When no, I, saw no, it. I, I remember it for having these them hugely, so like hugely complicated, um, like mental arithmetic sections in it, which yeah. re, which involved people having to memorize chains of numbers and then yeah. Do long division with them, and then memorize another chain of numbers. <laughs> and that's like, yeah, huge. Yeah, it's been, I, I'm, but it must have been. I think I, I must have been. Maybe even in single digits in age when I last saw that. I don't think I've seen it for a very long time. It, it, I remember it being on I've TV got... when I was a kid. Mm. And the sticking thing was these these people just being read numbers and then doing maths and then reading them back to people. I just remember the big zip line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they they it's also had one of the gladiators. So, but this is true. The nineties yeah. were very zip line heavy on TV. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Gladiators was good. Yeah, definitely it we was. Went to, we went to see that being filmed when I was a kid, and it was one of the most arduous experiences I've ever been through. It took, <laughs> it took all day. Yeah. It's like they have to keep setting up all the equipment in between each thing. And it takes mm-hmm. sort of like a good 25 minutes to set everything up. And like the okay. audience is just like, oh, we don't care. We really don't care. And it it took, I mean, we were there for, I would, I would hazard a guess, probably eight hours, eight, nine hours. Mm. <laughs> Crazy. Well, that, that's probably quite common to to, to many shows. I, I, was, I was reading uh, earlier be, this yeah. year about well, actually last year now, uh, Master Chef. Yeah, you know, they get an hour and a half to cook yeah a meal or whatever, but it takes so long for them to do the f- sort of filming and mm-hmm. the, the interviews bits and the chatting to the bits and the tasting bits. All the food when it gets tasted is cold. Oh yeah. Because it's it's just been out for so long, yeah. They they get some beauty shots as soon as it's kind of finished. They'll get to the, those close up shots that show the kind of yeah the, the little tendrils of uh, steam. Well, not technically mm. steam, but yeah, it kind of shows the kind of that it is hot. But by the time they actually get to the tasting, it's stone cold. Mm. And it's just like yeah. I suppose I suppose it even the playing field a bit, doesn't it? Yeah, but some, well, you, some you, fools you taste don't... better when it's cold as well. Anyway, you, you... Well, but some what you're stuff doesn't though, taste it? as well. Yeah, yeah, some mm. stuff doesn't taste as good. You, but you taste more when it's cold. Yeah, um, but some stuff obviously changes the taste profile as it cools as well. Yeah, but uh, things you know, I, I grew up with um, parents who were involved in TV shows and things like that. So you know, the, the, sort of the magic of TV is. It's been ruined for me from a very young age, um, but it's it's surprising just how how much longer everything takes compared to you know just just that twenty minute show you you watch or, or yeah. forty five minute show or whatever. I've I've done I've done several 
pieces. You, you've done little bits of extra work and stuff, haven't you? Yeah. Over the years. And um, a lot of it is just sitting and waiting for someone yeah. to reset the camera, to reset everything up, and go again. And um, we, we did some work for um, UK TV, which was a load of um, sort of like uh, sort of B-roll combat shots. Uh, so um, shield walls, swords fighting each other. And it, for a good proportion, you kept seeing it in any sort of like medieval documentary that had, you know, <laughs> it was like, oh, that's that. And they just, they just, they, in one day, they just, we were shooting for something else. And they just shot a load of these fight scenes and just cut them apart and used them everywhere. But yeah, I was in I was in one and it was the uh, the battle of Stamford Bridge, where the famous one where they got a, a Viking berserker was on the on the bridge and fought off hordes of people until they were eventually stabbed. And um if you look very carefully, I'm actually on both sides of the fight. <laughs> it was, it was, they didn't have enough people and it was very poorly managed. <laughs> <laughs> Again, stand up for TV stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, because you cause you've done TV stuff and film as well. Yes. You? Yeah, done a bit of that as well. Yeah. yeah. And again, most of it is just waiting, and then it's like, right, we're ready for you. Okay, everyone, go. Everyone, you're walking from here to here. You're walking from there to there. You go over there and stand there. You two pretend to talk over there, and there's going to be two people over there who are body standing for the main characters. We'll be filming them from behind as they walk away because those people are far away from here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be unseen. Now go. And yeah, so yeah. So you get to you get to sort of walk along and you know, walk from one end to the other and look, oh look, there's that guy over there who's meant to be Pierce Brosnan. So <laughs> <laughs> I find it quite funny. We've been to a few times when we've been up to London. There's been some filming happening. I mean, it, it, it's whether it's just coincidence. It's just been the times when we've been up there because we don't go up very often, or whether it's just actually it's something that's fairly common. I would, I would imagine probably with the amount of TV that's made, it, it's probably quite common. Never mind films. And it, it's something you kind of think, oh, it's it's trying to find out what this this film is or this bit of recording is, and then you kind of sort of then. You maybe find hang around for a little while and it's like <laughs> yeah nothing's happening so where... yeah, there's people milling around and but there's absolutely nothing happening for ages where, where i used to live which was sort of in uh, on the outskirts of london which is epping forest um it's a it's a big piece of very old woodland that's protected by old um like it's owned by the Queen, but it's looked after by the Corporation of London. It's all very, very ancient, and you can't you can't take a stick out of there bigger than your thumb, and all sorts of strange other old rules and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it, being just outside of London, just off of the M25, it was very, very popular, and still is very, very popular for TV companies to use when they want to shoot, you know, a forest scene, because yeah. you know it's it's just down the road and it's got a good car park. So every, every week there would be a, there'd be something being pulled up, and there's been Harry Potter shot there, and most famously, um, it's where the in the Monty Python the Holy Grail, where the the, the Black Knight gets his arms and legs cut off, is yeah. is like there's a when you go there there's this sort of like bit of meandering brook with a bridge over it, and there's a tree, and so if you go, if you if you go past it with the right sort of people they're like oh i've got to get my picture taken here and there's always a few people sitting there getting their picture taken so it's quite fun it's like taking, the, their arms, the, taking their arms behind their back yeah kind of <laughs> kneeling on it's the, the floor <laughs> it's the nerds equivalent of the lean and tower pizza show yeah and and it's the same uh, there were some other bits that, was, that were filmed at the sort of one of the lakes there and all that sort of stuff and it's, yeah because it's just it's just very conveniently positioned from most of the like Shepperton studio and all that sort of stuff is just around the corner. <laughs> so it's just a quick quick trip around the M twenty five, pull pull in, stop and uh film your thing and then drive back again. I love those kind of things so because it, it it's all like you said before, you know, about it being convenient and having a good car park. You know, it's the same with stuff like props and things, isn't it? You know, for a lot of things props for film or TV is just whatever's easily available and close to the prop department 
to go and buy. You know, like I've mentioned it before in in our actual uh, waffle chat. Um, those you know who've watched Stargate SG One, um, the the big kind of stabilizer clamps that these big massive red clamps that they've got that, that kind of hold the the Stargate up. They're uh, they're industrial mop buckets yeah. sprayed red. Yeah, because it just so happens they were about the right size, vaguely kind of shaped like the thing that they would could clamp with, and then yeah, they just painted them red. You know, they they could get them down the industrial supply, the cleaning supply place down the road. You know, I think classic, the classic Dalek is... with a plunger, a toilet plunger on the end. Well, not only yeah. that, they're also they're also the, the the bits on the top are um, indicators from is it a Morris Marina or Morris Thousand? Uh, near Morris Thousand, I think. Yeah. But yeah, um, no, the, came later. the bigger one for Doctor Doctor Who is the fact that he travels around in a in the TARDIS in the in the police box because it was convenient to go to locations and there would be a police box there, so yeah, we'll course, just yeah. use that. And yeah, because in, in the UK at the time there were lots of police boxes around. Wherever you went, you could find an angle to get one in. And, <laughs> Now they have a cla- the, the some of the ones they use now are collapsible. So yeah, I, this, this, this just four bits of plywood. I've actually worked and a on fifth one. of the roof. Yeah. Um. So I I did some work for a company who does uh, lots of neon lights, and I built. So I, I've got this really bad habit of saying yes to projects, no matter how ridiculous <laughs> they are. Um. And they basically went, "We want you to rip out the interior of a pub, and move it." sort of like half a mile down the road and install it in our gallery and i was like yes and then 10 minutes later i was like how am i going to do that so but, <laughs> Why um, am I gonna while, do I was, that? while i was doing that he the, the the person that owned it he bought lots of props and sort of stuff like that. and with his um with his uh neon lights he, he had quite a lot of whenever you basically whenever you see a neon light in anything for bbc he made it mm. and, and this is his gallery and he had Daleks and he had all sorts of bits that basically when he was walking past the props department, it would sort of say, how much for that? And and he had, like you say, a flat pack TARDIS. And he went to me, oh, I've, I've bought it. Can you can you sort of like put it put it up and screw it together so it's more permanent? And we could sort of, so we can have it in the corner of the room as like our little office sort of like cash handling spot. So yeah. <laughs> and like Andy said, they are just plywood with stuff stuck on the outside of them yeah it's sort of like three, three side or two or three sided so you can film someone from going into it and then out of it yeah film multiple people walking out of it because it's only got three sides <laughs> course, I, think yeah. I, mentioned, I think i've mentioned before it was, it was before I, re- I was really into sort of doctor i mean i, I, I was a fan of doctor Who as a kid but then kind of yeah, as, yeah through my 20s yeah kind of lost didn't lose love with it, just didn't, yeah, just doing other things. Yeah, TV wasn't kind of sort of a big thing for me. And but the the very first school that I was employed at, the ICT technician, his office was essentially the kind of little room at the back of the or the front of the lab. It was actually the front rather than the back. So he had to get through my lab to get to his little office, which is quite common in, in a huge number of schools to have that sort of arrangement. Essentially a little prep room, storeroom, office, off a, off a classroom or off a lab. And he, uh, yeah, so I used to go in there. It, it, was, it was quite handy. Yeah, he'd give me, I was teaching a little bit of ICT at the time. So it's like, oh, I've got any spare hard drives. Have you got, uh, I can take it apart and show you know, the students what it, a hard drive looks like inside. And, um, you know, have you got any computer boards anything that I could get my hands on that would kind of try and make the lessons more interesting particularly the, f- the first six months I didn't have access to a computer to teach these kids anything about ICT which was a laugh in itself the very different so, British school system <laughs> but yeah <laughs> but he had on on the shelf above his kind of where he sat in his little office there was the the, kind of the plunger from a Dalek and it was recognised, but it wasn't a just a plunger. It was the kind of the, the whole sort of decorated thing with the, the, the kind of the, the gun arrangement. And you know, I didn't go in there often, but one it was like, "Is that a?" He said, "Yeah, yeah." He he, he was one of the team that helped build them. And <laughs> uh, I mean, he would have been doing that in the seventies. 
uh, based on his age. Mm -hmm. So it's something yeah, he'd had around for ages. It's just like kind of wish I kind of got to know him a little bit better. Really, now that I'm much more of a Hoovian now than I was then. Mm -hmm. um, See, do you know what that? That's you. You say that 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 Hoovian thing. That's a relatively modern term, isn't it? Yes, it is. And because because previously there wasn't a there wasn't really a name for it. It was just you know just a sci-fi person, a person that liked Doctor Who. Yeah. Do you think, and this is this is going to be a weird one. Do you think that the modern Doctor Who is any better in its presentation than the older Doctor Who, or do you think the older one had was more story driven? because it had to rely on its story over its ability to have special effects? Or do you think the new one relies quite heavily on like, modern computer effects? Because I've, I've noticed with people I know that they, they are very sort of like divided. As to, when they say I'm a Whovian, they're like, I like the new There's stuff. the new or the old. And well, we, I, um, I disregard we got back into it. Before. Yeah, we, we got back into it. Or I got back into it. When my kids discovered... I'm trying to think of the, the order now. I can't remember if it was when Jodie Whittaker became the Doctor and it came on TV. And it was like, oh, there's this Doctor, there's a series, and they, they enjoyed the series. And, you know, there's this, there's this pluses and minuses to the Jodie Whittaker kind of incarnation. Some people hate it, but that, that, that's some of that's down to the writing, I think. Actually, I think she's a great actress, actor. And um, representation as well. There's the representation, there's some interesting stories, some of them were poorly written and, and whatever. Obviously special effects are amazing nowadays. And so that kind of grabbed their attention and, and then we sort of discovered I think it was iPlayer had some of the new incarnations. So we kind of went back and watched kind of the um McGann and Tennant and, and whatever and they really got and then we kind of watched it almost kind of binge watching working through and i hadn't i hadn't seen the new versions really uh, yeah, but I, yeah i would have been an adult when they were on but i was I, yeah saturday night more likely to be out than sitting down watching tv mm -hmm. um when i got into sort of teaching i didn't watch a lot of tv when i was sort of got into teaching because i'm too busy marking and, and planning and you yeah, know tv kind of didn't really function as a I think the only thing I can remember watching actually in my first few years of TV of, of teaching was a place I rented for a while the, I, I basically rented a room and the guy who owned it had satellite uh, or cable and every room had it and you could think so I can remember watching uh, this old house or New Yankee Workshop on a Saturday morning so basically I'd have a yeah. lie-in on a Saturday morning and, and kind of just stick the TV on with New Yankee Workshop and so, so we kind of, of leisure or something like yeah, yeah something like that yeah I can't, I can't even remember now but it was, it was basically kind of you know, a couple of hours of making on a, on a Saturday morning to kind of watch mm -hmm. well you know kind of maybe after uh, uh, well, just just after yeah Saturday morning just want to not faff about and just take it easy but we start we started getting into the kind of the sort of the Doctor Who through that and I I really enjoyed that kind of building up through sort of Tennant into Matt Smith and because we were watching it yeah we were watching as many as we could as often as we could yeah you know, to the detriment of kind of other things we, we, don't, we don't really kind of follow TV I mean yeah you know, when I was a kid you know it was every evening we'd sit down and the TV would be on I'd do my homework lying on the floor because I didn't have a very big room I didn't have a, a desk for very often so I'd kind of be doing my homework lying on the floor, be with the family, and the TV would be on from, yeah, literally when I got home at four o'clock through till, unless I was out for kind of cups or something like that, and through till I went to bed at kind of nine, nine thirty, depending on eight, ten o'clock, depending on how old I was. Um, so it'd be on all night, every night of the week. So we kind of watched a lot of TV. Now with, with that, I, I really enjoyed the, the new, um, the Doctor Who and uh, sort of seeing that built through and yeah there's some fantastic special effects and it is much more I think it's like a lot of modern TV and a lot of modern film you don't see the special effects now 
that if you watch an older thing, you kind of see the special effects. But when you watched the older thing years ago, you didn't really notice it because it was still the yeah, top of the line effects. Because we're now used to top of the line effects. You have used to the effects in, say, the Avengers. When you see something from 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, mm. it kind of stands out that, oh, look, there's that green line all the way around that character. Do you think they're against the green screen? Yeah, which has now disappeared with the use of... Oh, there's that big cloud of uh, of nitrogen vapour from underneath that car that's just flipped over. I wonder if that was a nitrogen can yeah. of <laughs> Oh, look, yeah, yeah. or well, you can actually see the kind of the, the cylinder underneath that's kind of where it's being shot at. Because the, yeah. the thing I feel with like, a lot of like stuff which is CGI is the fact that, I mean, if you watch... If you watch, like, Star Wars, the original Star Wars, and then you watch the... Um, the, the the prequels where George Lucas has started to lose his mind and it was just all like we must have like every every scene must be packed full of everything and there must be something going mm. and it's also you get these moments where these people are in these incredible places or there's this huge monster but it's not there so they there's no there's no weight to it yeah and yeah. they're not they're not interacting with it and that's something I find when I watch like you know newer Doctor Who to old Doctor Who, you know, here's this monster. Ah, it's terrifying. Ah, but the the characters don't seem to have the the weight of it on them because it's not there. Whereas yeah. this one, as much as it is ridiculous that it's a person in a costume, paper mache, they've monster. got something to actually interact and act with. Something more more physical. It, it's, is that down to the quality of the acting, though? Well, I was, I was going to go on to say because we because we we worked our way through from uh, Tennant Smith Capaldi um, in parallel to kind of watching sort of Jodie Whittaker. But a couple of years ago, for, uh, my youngest is is the big Whovian. Yeah, got all the books, studies the books. Yeah, he's got a complete almost encyclopedic knowledge as, as sort of teenagers do encyclopedic knowledge about that particular bit of nerd culture that they're interested in for the birthday present a couple of years ago we got a subscription to Britbox which is for those outside of the UK it's a uh, streaming package akin to Netflix but instead of kind of you know up to date stuff it tends to be mostly TV from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, it, and into the noughties from the mainstream TV. So from the BBC, from ITV, from Channel 4, there's kind of quite a mix. And it tends to be those series, the sort of things you might get on a, a, a box set of. Like mostly porridge, British and stuff. And horses and... Yeah. Um, oh, I can't even think of some of the other stuff. Inspector Morse, I think it's the one. Yeah, Jonathan watched. Creek, Rising Dam. Yeah. 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 Uh, things like that. And we bought the subscription because they had or have all of the available classic Doctor Who's mm -hmm. so we've worked through from uh, Hartnell and Troughton Pertwee and we're, we're now on the Tom Baker era I think we're on I think we're on season 16 now and we've been working through yeah we're now on the second birthday present of the year's subscription and we're kind of working through that and it, it is interesting to kind of watch uh, and to listen to those and see the, some quite fundamental differences I mean there are the, the classic things like yeah, the green screen from technology from the kind of the mid 70s is, is is awful really compared we did I, as a kid watching it in the 70s I didn't notice that it was awful no because you know. it, it, it was still the same state of the art then, belief. um, and yeah, it was there was that, that was that sort of I haven't been hadn't at that time been spoiled by the quality of CGI that you, you get nowadays. The some of the monsters, yeah, they literally are paper mache, you know. Sometimes you can literally see the bits of fishing line that are moving the tail around on some beast. And you can literally work out, oh, that's made from... Uh, th there was one we saw this last week. We, t we tend to watch them as a lunchtime treat. Yeah, we'll watch a couple of episodes. They're 25 minutes, or less than 25 minutes, with 
Yeah, because we can skip the intro on BritBox and we skip the, the mm. credits. So they're less than 25 minutes. So we watch a couple while we're having lunch. And it was like, oh, that's clearly a ping pong ball. <laughs> But yeah, this particular thing, it was, it was so obviously a ping pong ball. It had the, you could even on some of them sometimes see the scene. You couldn't see the, they clearly had held it or placed it so you couldn't see, like, you know, the, the, the maker's name that was often on the side of them. <laughs> but definitely ping pong balls may have been painted in a couple of them. There was lights inside some of them. Perfect size for a ping pong ball. And yeah, if you're the prop master, and you want something round or you want something to represent a communicator of some sort, well, how about we paint the mm. ping pong ball? red or we, we put a, a little light inside it you're going to do that that's that's absolutely fine and it's, it's it's fun to see that and to see some of the locations I, i've mentioned before i've actually it was one of the pertwee locations the place i actually worked uh so that was quite yeah kind of nice to kind of go oh yeah i know where that is yeah i've been in that corridor uh it doesn't exist anymore but i've been there but one of the, the, the really key things, I've, I've really noticed it this particular week, is that a lot of the actors were classically trained stage actors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is a, there's a huge difference in how a classically trained stage actor behaves compared to two, a TV actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even just silly things like, you know, they tended to use sort of you know, required pronunciation and they're they're enunciating things in a certain way and the, the way they kind of hold things the way they, they behave they are they they're still behaving as if they're they're of an audience it's a performance them, yeah rather than you know ignoring the camera and just doing it in position and, and behaving in what might be regarded as a more normal way of doing something but it, it, it's quite fascinating but of course because those I think the stories aren't necessarily stronger or better, but I think they were presented differently. Mm. Some of the stories, and I, I, I think it's probably the same as modern Doctor Who. Who is the kind of the showrunner? Who is the writer? Who's put the script together? Who's then deployed that script with the team of actors that they've got? Um, and yeah, how well has that worked? You can, you could see tensions between, say, Tom Baker and, and Louise Jameson. Yeah, there, there were tensions if you kind of follow the kind of the wiki fan base type sort of websites, and you can kind of read about how you know, he didn't. And Doctor Who got quite violent back in the kind of the, the, the sort of seventies, and there were complaints about the level of violence. And Tom Baker didn't particularly like the level of violence, and he saw. Uh, Louise Jameson's Leila character as, as quite a violent character and that was something that you could that, that generates attention that you don't necessarily see there was still the political you know people talk about like with Jodie Whittaker about how some of the episodes were quite um, trying to be politically correct and they were kind of trying to maybe drive forward sort of uh, social narratives mm. that was happening yeah, it's all, that's always been happening. Yeah, it, 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 they're, they're, they're still there, and you know, in, in some ways, it, it's quite, it's quite sad that some things are still, just haven't changed. Mm. Yeah, the whole kind of you know, the, the sexism that existed and was being pointed out by characters, and therefore the, you know, the script writers in some of the early, yeah, of the very first series of, of Doctor Who. Yeah, and that same kind of narrative is still happening because it's it's things haven't necessarily changed that much in society sci-fi has been very very good at doing that yeah. you know I mean, even things like you know it, it's it's quite common knowledge that you know star trek being you know uh, the, the first interracial kiss um you know things like that if driving home and driving forward you know things that diversity and and things that should be social norms and things that are you know areas that need change or improvement or you know that, that's kind of been a bit of a, a staple of sci-fi for as long as sci-fi has been a thing yeah you know, in terms of popular culture and popular media especially well, go, go, go back to hg wells yeah yeah absolutely yeah look at the, the essentially the the, the, the social oh, narratives that were being discussed Ooh. further back yeah. mary shelley's frankenstein yeah <laughs> 
yeah, yeah. Know, the, the original, <laughs> arguably the, the the first kind of um, sci-fi thing that started it all. You know, one of, one yeah. of the um, one of the most interesting things about the especially early series Star Treks is that its its main viewership was unusually for the time mostly female. Yeah, because of the time the time of day it was shown. And yeah, so it had a, it had a huge female, and then only sort of like only later on, once it became more popular, did the more you know engineering student kind of get, person get into it. But yeah, it's so it's and yeah, yeah it, I, it, I, was, I it was essentially a soap opera in space, wasn't it? You know, the, yeah. The, yeah, that's how it was pitched. Yeah. And it is, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it means it, it's held up by the two hundred percent acting of uh, some of the characters in it. Well. <laughs> And again, the the, you know, the dodgy props. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. look, let's just pick up this rock. Well, one, one of the yeah. interesting things about, especially with Star Trek, is um, so like like you said earlier, where where, you, where you're looking at the things and you're looking to see those items that are you recognise. There's there's a whole like sort of like field of like examining these greeb they call greeblies the bits yeah. of junk that attach to stuff. And like, identifying which airfix kit they came from, that sort of stuff, and stuff like that adds a level of sort of like subconscious realism mm. to it because it, 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 when you see that, even if you don't actively see it, you sort of like it. it it's stuff that you recognise is is in the world. It sort of brings you in. Whereas like newer stuff, obviously you can just three D print wherever you want, so it doesn't yeah. have to exist to just make it. But in Star Trek, they they were very particular about making sure that. It wasn't stuff that you saw. But the things were like the phases were made, the communicators were made, all of the desks yeah. and stuff were, were manufactured and made to look futuristic and alien. And so you wouldn't be able to recognise it because it's meant to feel alien and futuristic. Well, it's interesting actually that you, you mentioned that kind of thing because even like um, Wonder Vision, the, the Marvel. TV show, there, there was you know like a prop in that that was supposed to be some big futuristic fancy scanner thing, and uh, when I was, I was watching the show, hang on a minute, I'm like, there's there's my one of these. This is this, you know this super fancy futuristic tech thing that you just order online. Well, in, uh, you you, in, you in, have the, oh. the, the replica the, the replica prop forum, yeah. which is where you've got this community of people who are, are doing that kind of thing of like. Analyzing these little bits. Sorry, what in, you said about in, in in Picard, the um the replicators in aboard his ship are flash forge three D printers. <laughs> yeah. And someone's just gone, yeah, just buy like four of them and put them over there. And yeah, at that point, it's sort of like it's almost like they like say that's where the la the laziness sort of level dips down <laughs> into the, just buy the thing and put it over there, and it yeah. and it and it feels odd when you see a character interact with it, but then looking for the little bits of like. Normality in it is sort of half the fun. Yeah, this is true. I think what I did this with Star Trek. I think that one of the things I really liked about Star Trek, uh, when I when I discovered it, was that they actually employed even from the early days they employed scientists on the yeah. show to basically go look. Okay, we are bending the laws of physics to a certain extent. Yeah, warp technology, not something... Well, there's, there's potentially... There was some physics news this last week or so. That, yeah, potentially yeah. some warping has happened on a very small scale. Um, very, very small but scale. Essentially, probably. they employ scientists to basically go, is this viable? Yeah. Could this work? Is, scientifically, does this work? And I, there, there are limitations of things like, yeah, oh, look, we've got this green-skinned uh, alien who also happens to have a pink mouth mm -hmm. because they didn't have the the uh, prop cosmetics to be able to dye the inside of somebody's <laughs> mouth yeah. at that time. And they stand uh, around six foot tall, two arms, two legs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everything's vaguely humanoid. Yes. Wherever you go in the universe, <laughs> all humanoid. Um, it, it, they they relate that because apparently if, if all of I think it's humans, Vulcans, Romulans, and Klingons all share a single original like common ancestor. They've travelled space and seeded the planets before, 
Well, so the, this is when you get into things like Voyager um, and being over in the Delta Quadrant and coming across a, a vaguely lizard-like thing that some somehow recognised the fact that we originated from Earth and then sort of went, I'm going to, what the hell are you doing out here? We left Earth 65 million years ago when there was a big asteroid impact. We, we um, you know, we, we kind of like hold up in a in a few caves until we evolved opposable thumbs made spaceships and buggered off mm. yeah. <laughs> yeah you know wonderful things like that but i to sort of look back around with all that kind of stuff the the main thing i think with those uh and that the the distinction between like shows who've put a bit of effort in and spoken to you know, scientists, uh, you know, it's, it's all about that suspension of disbelief. And I think there are, there are times that where shows get it really, really wrong. Um, you know, there's a show I used to watch called Scorpion. It's, um, nerd central, basically. It's, it's just, I mean, it, it's, it's quote unquote, loosely based around uh, a real guy who runs this think tank in the States, Irish genius, basically. Um, and his team that are, you know, solving big crazy problems and stuff. And the first episode, it's it's amazing and ridiculous. Uh, you know, the not to spoil the episode for anyone who decides to go and watch it, but there is, you know, the, the, there's an over the air update that corrupts um, all of the computer control systems for air traffic control around the world, and there just happens to be a load of planes. That can't land, uh, and this kind of and it's this this whole kind of thing of like it, it wipes out the whole lot, messes everything up. But there just happens to be one backup copy on one plane that's running out of fuel. So they they end up having to this this plane comes in. The pilots, you know, he's on the radio to them. And he said, you know, I can I can get this low. So he's then you know work the the, the super genius um, Walter O'Brien you know works out how fast he needs to be traveling gets this car that's you know gets like some ridiculous like ferrari or something rips the roof off and he's there with the uh someone driving flat out down the runway as fast as it can go with this car and he's there with a with a laptop and they're, they're dangling <laughs> the, the, the plane comes down and they're dangling an ethernet cable out and, and he, he grabs the ethernet cable plugs it into the laptop you can quickly <laughs> type the thing enough to to get this copy of this piece of software from the from the airplane ready to disconnect just before they you have to slam the brakes on and you know all this kind of thing to uh, it's, it's so outlandish and so ridiculous but it's it's fantastic yeah and there's loads of really really you know so far out of the tech sphere of possibility that you can quite happily just kind of ignore the, the stupidness and just enjoy it for the entertainment of what it is you know it's, it's outlandish it's ridiculous but it's it's just almost believable to go well, yeah, maybe you know with with enough money with enough whatever maybe not that time frame maybe not quite done that way and then the, there was a bit that completely just ruined an episode for me where they're in some like backwater uh, like terrorist hideout somewhere trying to you know it, it's like a you know a um, hostage situation in a you know like Tunisia or some kind of like middle of nowhere fancy mansion type thing but essentially in like you know not a big tech savvy first world country type thing and he, he just happens to have his his you know his android tablet that's running some super fancy special version of some operating system you've never seen um, that he can do anything with, and he, he he's he's decided that he needs to be able to see something somehow, and like pulls the back off, you know, just like rips the back off a phone and takes the specific camera out of the phone, scratches the lens, pulls the back off his tablet, jabs the wires in, and then can like see, you know, some. And it was just as a as a tech person, you go in. That's just not. <laughs> Not that's how not happens. how that works <laughs> no matter how good you are that's not going to happen 
like the sort of hackers you see in sort of TV films who just kind of you just dance two of them typing on the, the keyboard. Thing. Yeah, the, the, the ones that don't own a map. Coming up. Yeah, <laughs> streams of data and, and code going up. It's like, but but like at the same time, that there was there was another episode that was you know the the trapped underwater in a or not trapped underwater. They're trapped in a in a thing that's being flooded. And they had to do like this, um, you know, sort of like a hypoxic thing where they were they were cycling the oxygen through the blood. You know, and it was basically like a, a blood transfusion, <laughs> putting the oxygen back in the blood and retransfusing to, you know, because that was what they could basically do. They couldn't get any air down there. His lungs were going to fill up with water, but they had to keep him oxygenated, you know, and it was like they could get the machine up and out through a small gap, but they couldn't get him out. You know, so it was things like that. You think, well, that, that that's medically kind of feasible, a bit janky, maybe. You know, it's plausible enough. It's it's quite cool. It's you know, it's 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 quite funky. But then, just like you know, pulling the back with your bare hands, pulling the back off a tablet, jabbing some wires in, and and it, the camera just happens to work. You know, it's like no, you'd have at least needed a spudger there, not just pull the back <laughs> off. <laughs> I was going to say, for anyone who's ever attempted to take apart a tablet, it's generally not that easy to get the back no. off. <laughs> but yeah, that's the, that's the beauty of TV, though, isn't it? And it's it's the MacGuffin, isn't it? It's the uh, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's it's all unobtainium and MacGuffins and that kind of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah, kind of going back to props. I I I think Star Wars has kind of become the I, I, every every sci-fi had, and every, every TV thing that, have, that have attracts nerds uh, has its own kind of you know, a prop culture. Yeah. But I think I think perhaps Star Wars has possibly the biggest because of a you know, it's it's been one of the longest running cinematic universes. Mm. I mean Star Trek. Yeah, you know, yes, it, they were Star Trek films, but. Most people we don't talk Star about Trek half of those. as yeah Star Trek. Most people tend to think of as a TV series, whereas most people think of Star Wars as a film. So it's kind of got that cinematic uh, sort of feel to it, and I I think because of that, and because you've got these these particularly unique props like the lightsabers, yeah, and the kind of the stormtrooper helmets or the Darth Vader sort of helmets. And the droids, because obviously they're, they're particularly you know, the R two type droids, are particularly kind of popular. You know the whole kind of astromech builders kind mm. of forum. But I think what I particularly find quite what I find interesting is the fact that people who are into Star Wars will often not just kind of go right. I'm going to be. It's like uh, I'm thinking of comparison, you know, Avengers. A lot of people will build an Iron Man suit, yeah. Or you'll get somebody, you know, women dressing up as, say, um, Black Widow, mm. or or the various other characters. You get those kind of character props. Yeah, yeah it's like cosplay. It, it's it's it, the hero props, isn't it? It's the, yeah. It's the the main characters rather than. Whereas with I think with Star Wars, what you, I I see more of mm -hmm. are people kind of going, I really like Star Wars. I'm going to make my kitchen into a Star Wars style kitchen. I'm going to make my li my living room into. I'm going to have Star Wars style couches. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to build my entire house or or just my den, my 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 maker space, my builder space, my watch my TV space, my kind of you know man cave or whatever i'm going to make it so that it, it looks like a cantina i'm going to have or it looks like the kind of it could be the the living quarters on board a, a, a freighter of some sort a small small freighter you know, or the millennium falcon or or the like and so you get people not just building the hero props but you get people building kind of i'm going to build a prop it's just of the universe yeah whereas yeah doctor who other things, the you know, Marvel people tend to build only the hero props. Well, I think another thing that Star Wars is very good at is, like you say, not not just the in-world props or you know the, in the style of, but the fact that you have is it the five hundred one club or the 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 five hundred legion? 
Yeah, that's the one. Well, yeah, it's something like that. Um, but the fact that it's you know they're it's 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 a group of people who want to make stormtrooper suits. Yeah. Um, you know, and you think you wouldn't get that in something like the Avengers. You wouldn't get people making you know groups of people dressing up like Chitari soldiers. Uh, you know, it's 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 not. It doesn't have that same kind of uh, gravitas, I think, as it's like. A, a group of people all turning up to a to a convention, you know, you got twenty people turning up as stormtroopers and all congregating together and sharing that kind of stuff. It's it's its own entity. It's, I think. it's the scale. It's, 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 it, I believe that they often do a lot of sort of charity work as well. So they're almost they like do, kind yeah. of the, the Rotary Club or the Lions Club, where they kind of they have this thing in common, but they'll then use that to, you know raise money or to you know cheer up sick kids in hospital or all the yeah. like but i mean the, the fact that it's you know because the, the stormtroopers are they're not the heroes they're not the um they're not the main characters they're not you know speaking parts essentially you know they're, they're just henchmen you know at best um but their faces yeah. are covered, which means that anyone can stick a helmet on. And you don't have to perform. You don't have to look vaguely similar to... You know, uh, apart from those people who are a little, bit, a little bit too short to be a stormtrooper. I think that, that, is, that is one of the... That is part of the... So, I, I, I was, for a long time, a big fan of Star Wars. And then, unfortunately, I watched the newer Star Wars films... <laughs> and I'm not anymore. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who are going to hate me, hate me for that. But when I first saw Star Wars: A New Hope, it was so impactful to me as as the child that I saw it. I can I can the, the moment the, the first thing I see is this huge this huge spaceship go over, and I'm like, oh my god, I love spaceships. This is the best film ever. And then a the bigger spaceship minutes. comes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, more spaceships, more better. <laughs> and then there's robots and like all this sort of stuff I saw. And then Laser the door falls open and Darth Vader walks in. And I know nothing about Darth Vader. And as, you know, maybe five years old, five, six years old, that's the bad guy. He is. Oh, the, yeah. He just walks in, he is the bad guy. And, but to me, that mystery that would that went with it i don't know who he is all i know is he's just this dark figure who just looks so imposing and he's surrounded by these people they're all in white they're all they're all blank you know they're all the blanks and then there's him in the middle he is the bad guy it was so like how can i put it it, it, it says like you can watch you can watch um pretty much the whole of a new hope with no sound and still know what's going on yeah yeah. And there's certain parts of it that the unexplainedness of it, you know, who is this Obi Wan Kenobi? What is a Jedi? What is, you know, what is this? What is, and there's this. Why is that guy lo looking down the end of the sword? Yeah, yeah. It, it lures you in with the mystery. What mm. what is this? This whole, you know, these these, and then they have this, and then you go on and and there's something about that that, that there's that aesthetic, like you say that, like Andrew was saying that there, there's this. Star Wars aesthetic that you can just apply to so many things mm. and it mm. tells the story without any kind of, you know I mean now with the way Disney are handling it, it's Star Wars is so prevalent everywhere, there's you know, there are plankton on the bottom of the Marianas Trench that know what a stormtrooper <laughs> is it's everywhere, it's in every form. I think you'll find the, the midichlorians, not uh, plankton yeah, probably are um, but and and as, as I sort of grew older, I found that the Star Wars extended universe, where people yeah. decided that it was absolutely necessary that every single character must have a full backstory and explanation to it. Yeah, and it's just like, no, it doesn't. Half of it, half of the the great thing about this is is the mystery. Mm. Who is Darth Vader? I don't need to know anything about him, but I know he's bad. Look at him. <laughs> Who is this mysterious? Jedi guy, what's the, and how is he doing these powers? Like, you know, but in the newer films, everything has to be explained and everyone has to know everyone. And 
everyone knows everyone else and Chewbacca is always there for some reason it's like 500 years old and everyone knows everyone else like, what? <laughs> That was the first I, I film I ever saw in the cinema. Of time, it? Yeah, Sorry? that that was the very first film I saw in the cinema. Really, Star Wars, School Trip as well. Oh. I never, I, I've seen, I've seen Star Wars in the cinema when I was younger, and they did the digital re-releases. I mm. saw it, and then I've obviously seen it again since. But no, I, I know I'm not old enough to have seen it when it when it came out and had that that impact. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, just some. I mean, A was the first time I'd ever been to a cinema. So that was kind of like big deal. But then, let's mm. just say, yeah, on this sort of screen, yeah, in color, because at the time we we only had a black and white TV at home. Um, to actually then kind of sort of see There's yellow writing. Yeah, and <laughs> it's going like up. Say, when you've got that imperial destroyer kind of going and just keeps going and it just keeps going, it just keeps going, it keeps going. And it's just like it's and then the music scale and yeah. yeah. They say you know, Darth Vader comes in. Not only is he sort of you know this huge, black, ominous, but there's that music, you know, that kind of very sort of droney march. You kind of like, mm, you almost like want to hide. Yeah, because he he is a terrifying presence. Mm. You know, the first thing he does is he walks in and literally just picks someone up in one yeah. hand and kills them. <laughs> He's like, okay, yeah, he, yeah. You can't get a more baddie than that, can you? <laughs> it certainly grabs your attention. It does, and it, and it did for for thirty years, and and then they ruined it. So there's that. Did. Yeah, and I. I another person tries to tell me about Baby Yoda. I'm going to punch them. <laughs> oh, but no, this is the this is the thing. This is where it's interesting because I can punch you through the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the Mandalorian isn't a Star Wars thing. It's a Western. It's not a sci fi Star Wars thing. It just it just happens to have the aesthetic, but it's a Western. Boba Fett's in it, isn't he? Yeah. So we couldn't be bothered to create any new characters. We just had to go we have to go with Boba Fett, who we know, who we know will sell the toys and do all that sort of stuff. But he's yeah. only in that like Briefly, later on in series two, all this, all this like other non-connected Star Wars stuff. But they all, is they, kind of they like all look, This is the thing. They all look like Boba Fett. They all wear the Boba Fett style armor to look like it because the, no one has the gravitas, the power to just create a new character and put it out there and be like, "I've created something new." But no, no, it's got to look like something people recognize. Otherwise, we cannot sell toys of it. And you know, it must be a tiny. Oh, we should look after a baby. What's it going to look like? Oh, it's going to be a baby. Mm, don't think so. No. Oh, all right, baby Yoda. Oh yeah, yeah. I can get them in there. <laughs> Kids in Malaysia already making that toy. <laughs> and that, and that's how, and that's how you ruin a franchise. By just uh, having... I, w- I would say that the Star Wars franchise was on the road to ruin before that happened. In terms of the films. Yeah. I mean, the prequels were a thing. They were. It, it's like it's like so if, if someone sits you down and goes, "I will give you a hundred pounds if you can tell me what the plot of Episode One was." I, this, <laughs> episode One's easy. Some dude gets cut in half, and there's a pod race. That's all you need to know. Mm. It, why, for but, why, but why was the Trade Federation blockading Naboo? <laughs> Topher Grace who was the guy who played the lead character in that 70s show he, after that 70s show he wanted to get into doing like different stuff and like direction and production and this kind of stuff so he decided to start learning video editing and one of the things he did because there's the machete order which is the kind of um the, the if someone's never done Star Wars, it's the the best order to introduce them to the films, without ruining, uh, you know the 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 particular order of sequence of events. 
So the suggestion is to watch... Um, which order is it? Episode 1, Episode 2, A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, then... Oh, whichever, which, however, whatever the machete order is, it, it's basically it's it's the sequence to watch them in that doesn't ruin the the big reveal in Empire Strikes Back. And one of the other ways of doing it is to watch episode four, episode five, episode one, episode two, episode three, episode six, as the kind of for the to to watch the the original three and the prequels in the way that it doesn't spoil it. What Topher Grace did was re-edited the the prequels into one marathon film um that would he then showed to a handful of people and the idea was that it would just cut out any of the rubbish so it cut out all that stuff on the 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 galactic federation council and all that kind of rubbish and it just put the essential bits for the story and then there's been a because it, it was never released it was shown to a handful of people and it was kind of talked about and explained and things like that so a few people have tried to recreate it and there's a there's a thing you can find on the internet if you search hard enough called the last turn to the dark side and it is basically the anakin story so they've cut out all of the rubbish and they've just done it's the it's the the prequel trilogy re-edited into one three-hour movie that has just Anakin's arc. Do you know what they've taken from episode one? They've taken just the scene where Qui-Gon and um, Obi-Wan are fighting Darth Maul. <laughs> Qui-Gon gets killed, Darth Maul gets cut in half, and then it cuts to the... Uh, the it's basically like the credits, and then the episode two information starts. That's all they've kept out of episode one. It's just it's, that fight scene. It, 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 it opens with the fight. with the gates coming through. It, it's amazing. It's incredible. It makes no sense, but it's an incredible fight scene. Yeah. But in, in that world, in that in that same vein, I really hope that there exists a version which is just all Imperial Council stuff. And it's just, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just four hours of just constant bureaucracy, boring bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Yeah, can't even say bureaucracy. That's the cider. That's, that's done that. The, uh, yeah, that. That will do it. Inability yeah, to speak. Yeah, here's one of those things. Tell, tell me what the plot of episode one is. I mean, it's like, I can't. <laughs> I can't tell you. It makes absolutely no sense at all. But it looks yeah. amazing. It does. And it still I'm, looks amazing now. A lot of, if memory serves, back from my college days, I think it was a, a matte artist called Charles Darby who did a lot of the matte painting for... Um, for those big, huge, glorious scenes. Um, yeah, we, we had to do a little bit of a piece on him in college. Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. But yeah, the, and the most recent Star Wars films, you just like, you sort of watch, you watch the, the, the Force Awakens, you go, oh, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Uh, there's, there's the characters I know, and some of them have been killed, and all that sort of okay. And then it just goes on, and then the last one, I sit there and I'm like, what is this? Well, I haven't seen what? that yet. I, I, I oh, watched. Save yourself, don't bother. Well, no, I, I, I want to just get through them, um, just so I know what's going on, and then that'll be it. I can just put them. Yeah, I, I, I see it either. I've seen one. I've, I've seen one episode of Mandalorian. You, you will, Mandalorian's you'll, you'll, really, really good. You'll, it's, you'll it's, get to the end of 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 the of the most recent trilogy, and you'll just sit there. Like I, I walked out of this. It was. There's only been a few films that have ever, that has ever happened to me. With. And you just walk out and you go, "What did I just watch? What? What? what, what was there a gas leak in the cinema or something? Like, what did I just see?" The only other film that's ever done that is Alien Covenant. Mm. You just walks out and I'm like, "Why are those people so stupid? Why did they pick them for the space mission?" <laughs> Of all the people you could have chosen, you chose them people. It's just, yeah. <laughs> and, but yeah, the, the last start, I just again, why did you bring that? Like, of all the characters you could have brought back that you didn't need to bring back, that you could have created new, original, interesting characters to fill the place of, why him? <laughs> but, I mean, it's, 
it's it's money, isn't it? It's same and that's what it's become. That's yeah. what's become, and it's just it's so prevalent everywhere that it's just it's just to me now it's just lost all of its mystery and interest, and I'm just done. Just yeah. it's just so abundant. I'm just I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't, before I don't we get into people. before we get into a dark place and chat <laughs> for another five hours. Oh yeah, three hours and nineteen minutes. Shall we slide into what's been grabbing our attention, Andy? I was just going to say, oh, Andy, he's, he's got to. Yeah, you, you've kind of if you've gone off Star Wars, what is grabbing your attention? Well, what is grabbing my attention? Uh, apart from all the things we've previously mentioned, um, <laughs> the resin print. Yeah, we, so we've got the resin printing. Yeah, yeah, the resin printer and I- imminent death through inhalation of uh, toxic fumes. Um, don't don't drink any of the stuff. Oh, you're too late for that. Um, <laughs> I've got to see what it tastes like. It tastes like burning. Um, uh, I don't know. When it comes to like what, what has been grabbing my attention as such, um, I mean, I, you, YouTube is pretty much my only source of entertainment. And I think probably, at least both of you and for everyone else, probably that is still left in the chat if there is anyone, um, we probably share quite a lot of the same uh, subscriptions and interests. So there's not a lot. So I thought, because everything's going to be maker wise, I thought I'd come up with something a little bit different. Yeah, so there's a there's channel called Geo Wizard, which hmm. is a bit weird. So I'd expect nothing less, mate. They mostly do video of them playing the uh, the game GeoGuessr, which is where it shows you a picture of somewhere on the Earth, and you've got to try and find it on Google Earth. <laughs> but what the other thing they do is they do these challenges where they try and cross countries in a dead straight line. Mm. Uh, so far, they've done Wales and Scotland. And... Oh, physically, that, the guy who physically walked across Wales. Physically in one straight line. Yeah, yeah. I've seen that. I've seen the Wales one. one. Side yeah. To the other. Yeah. And they're just these really great, like, adventures where you just you don't know what's going to happen next and you're just, you're just following it on and, like, they're running, they, you know, they, they have to stick on the line and they're having to do things like run through people's back gardens because their back garden's on the line. And it's just really, like, just good adventure. He, he yeah. crosses Norway at one point and he gets stuck in a bog and it's it's quite tense because he's you know he is on his own with a camera struggling mm-hmm. in a bog. It's quite it's quite intense and uh, so yeah, I thought I'd I thought I'd come with that one. It's a cracking recommendation. It is. It's, it's they've done all. You can sit down and sort of like watch them all in one go. Mm. And uh, yeah. And the, the other one I had was a channel called Bald and Bankrupt. Uh, and it's not it's not Jamie's alternative channel. It's um, a guy who, he's bald, he is bankrupt, but he travels the world. And he's just, again, it's just him on his own. And he just goes to the most crazy places and just sees the most crazy things. He arrives in a, in a, in a country and just walks out of the, walks out of the airport and just sees what happens. And there's he was most recently he was in um, Kazakhstan. Uh, was it Kazakhstan or is it Trans Intercontinental? Anyway, um, and they just rented a car and just drove up the side of a mountain to try and get to these like little tiny enclaves of the former Soviet Union and stuff like that. And he's been in South America, just like wandering in and going and just walking up to people in the street, going, "What's the most dangerous area of this of this this city?" And they're going, oh, got there. And he just goes up there and goes and checks it out. So, As you do. Yeah. So I, I thought I'd choose some travel stuff to widen your views because everyone's already seen all the maker stuff. They're always just glad to the same things that I'm subscribed to anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> this is fair. Jamie, is what fair. about you? Um, I, well, I've, I've had a couple of interlopers this weekend. You have? I have, yeah. But, um. Duncan Band and Simon Harmon came to visit. Um, drove all the way up from, from down south into into uh, into the wastelands of uh, of the Midlands. Yeah. So yeah, we we had a we had a, an, a lovely afternoon and evening on Friday. Um, some wonderful Mexican food. 
and uh, I got to introduce them to chimichangas, which are delightful. Um, subjected them to f the film Free Guy, which is hilarious. Um, and then, yeah, on uh, they kipped over at hotel, and then on Saturday we had a, a lovely day of nattering maker stuff and nerdy stuff. Um, dragged them to my local wonderful bakery, the Butterwick Bakery. Um, and we had delicious, delicious shakes and bakes, and it was wonderful. Um, so that was a, that was a delightful treat. Have some some friends around, um, and I. Last week, I finally took the plunge to start listening to the Bobbyverse, which is what uh, Steve House off of Tools of Tools has recommended a couple of times on there. And I've got to say, that is also pretty damn good as a book. Very nerdy, uh, but right up my alley. That's How about good. you, Andy? What's What's been grabbing your attention? Uh, oh, it's been a bit of a week this week. Um, just... Some good, goodish things. I have, I've finally got round to upgrading the uh, SSD in my computer, uh, my main computer, which of course creates all sorts of problems. You know, yep. things not necessarily working properly. It's still, I think I've only logged into about half of, not even half, <laughs> probably about a third of my <laughs> accounts, and having issues with various things. Slowly trying to work through those. Uh, yeah, almost wrecked my car. I may, I may still have wrecked my car, uh, picking up my youngest from a youth club um, on a Friday night on a new state development which hasn't got properly finished roads. And I went around a corner, there was a car parked wide on the section, so I kind of veered in. But what I hadn't spotted was this very obscure shaped bit of curvature, uh, which I drove straight into, which blew out my tyre and I think possibly hopefully it's just tracking is out of alignment because mm. I have to steer slightly to the left to get the car to drive in a straight line so I've already spent 100 quid on a new tyre um, the rim was thankfully okay um, yeah it was lucky one right? hopefully it's just the uh, hopefully it's just the tracking and not some bent expensive thing um the, it's going into the garage tomorrow. They're, they're, cho they're book chocker, but they said they'll try and look at it over the. Luckily, it's half term, so they'll try and look at it over the next few days. Mm. Uh, work out what it is and hopefully fix it, and hopefully it's not too expensive. Um, but that's a bit annoying. Uh, there's been a few other things this week. That, yeah, it's some not some not so good things. Uh, a relative by marriage who's seriously ill, not COVID, but seriously ill to the point where it's probably not going to come through um, Sorry to hear and they're younger that. than me so that's not been so good mm -hmm. um, yeah so it's, it's mostly been I'm trying, I'm trying to keep I'm trying to keep on the kind of positive I've got computer problems but I've got a computer and yeah. I've been able to kind of upgrade it I've got car problems but I have a car I'm trying to kind of focus on the kind of the, the positive aspects mm -hmm. of things, but it it not always been so easy this week. Yeah, it's been a bit of a I've had better weeks. I think is the way to put it. Um, don't think I've made anything or done anything apart from my daily art. Apart from that, I've, I've not done really anything constructive. Uh, apart from oh, completely fit, rebuilding your PC and Ooh. yeah, and putting a new monitor in. I've got, got a new yeah. monitor. Uh, which I've installed so I've got three monitors um, catching so up with me yeah I, that's just, I think that's going to be the limit of how much space I've got I can't fit anything else with it. <laughs> I can see perfectly serviceable bits yeah, of you're saying, yeah you can fit it in there yeah I know you can fit something in there yeah that's not going to happen <laughs> think, uh, my, my, my lady wife is uh, it's like I thought we're just going to replace one of the monitors with that new one yeah, well, they could have done, but three looks good. Could be useful. <laughs> so, but yeah, hopefully next week's going to be better. Well, it depends on what happens with the car tomorrow. Or yeah, Tuesday or Wednesday, whenever they get round to it. That's going to be the choice, isn't it? 
Yeah, it's gonna be a bit of an interesting drive to get there. It's six, six or seven miles today. Uh, and I think I mean, yeah. I, I could, there's there's two routes to get. Well, there's more, more than two routes, but there's there's two possible routes to get there. And I think I need to take the uh, slightly longer but slower one rather than the one that involves take the uh, one whichever has the most turns that are in the direction of your <laughs> well i want to try i want i want to try and avoid the dual carriageway that yeah sensible i'm not going over 40 miles an hour that's mm. if i can average 30 i'll be happier with that um, but that's what it is but that makes sense it's uh, one of those things as they say it is what it is indeed it is. Well, so Andy, here's the big question is if people want to come and stalk you, where would they do so? If they do, they... Or if they want to come and sling you abuse about your uh, preferences on, on popular media. Oh, that is um, an unwise thing to do because I have <laughs> lots of opinions and I will happily sit there and type them all out. Um, if they do want to follow me, uh, they um, can seek help at uh, various <laughs> numbers. Um, no, uh, you can find me on mine. Twitter at uh, which is at NoMasterC. You can find me on Instagram at NoMasterCreations, and you can find me on YouTube, uh, YouTube.com slash NoMasterCreations. But I haven't done anything on YouTube for a long while, and I don't. You haven't. Do However, I would highly recommend anyone who's interested in stuff that we have talked about tonight, and who's interested in stuff like uh everyday carry stuff and oh yeah we should talk about everyday carry stuff and he's got another four hours worth of uh <laughs> four hours yeah, i'm about to go for i might have to go for an empty anna top up yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. uh andy has a fantastic video that you all need to go and watch and then uh we can only apologize for all of the stuff you go and buy <laughs> that's all i'm going to say but you know his edc video the, the worst bit i'll link it in the show notes. most of that and i need to do no video so I <laughs> right, well before we do go off on another several hours I would just like to thank you for joining us Andy and for stepping yeah. in thank you for having well. me um, I'm glad yes. I could step in yeah particularly for stepping in kind of essentially last minute to uh, for Brett uh, we, we will absolutely be having you back on to discuss EDC stuff and weird foods and that's yes. where we're going to leave that. And, and next time, hopefully, if you give me enough lead up, I'll be able to send some stuff out to you. We will have a, a tasting evening. Yes. <laughs> that sounds brilliant. Right. Well, on that note, right, no. good night, folks. Cheers, folks. See you later.